and uh, uh, I will announce uh, the first speaker and then uh, uh, Michael and I will take turns. So the first speaker uh, today, um, Eric, you would, would you like to share your... Um... Yep, I am doing it, sharing, okay. Yes, so we are very happy to have Eric Ling talk to us about the point spectrum of the Dirac Hamiltonian and the zero gravity Kerr-Newman space-time. Okay, great. Thank you, Shadi. And thank you everyone for um, coming to my talk. I am very excited to start off this session with a topic I find very interesting. So I will be talking about the point spectrum of the Dirac Hamiltonian on the zero gravity Kerr-Newman or ZGKN space-time. And this is a joint work with my wonderful advisors, Shadi Tevledar Zadeh and Michael Kiesling. Okay, so let me give a quick outline of what I'm going to talk about. So we have a long-term goal, which is understanding the general, general relativistic effects on quantum mechanics. And in particular, we want to pay special attention to hydrogen. Uh, most models that uh, solve hydrogen can done, be done so analytically. So we will first review the Dirac equation for an electron in a proton's Coulomb field. This is the usual Dirac equation that one normally encounters when studying the hydrogen atom. And this model, it successfully breaks the hidden SO4 symmetry appearing in the Schrodinger equation, resulting in fine structure. Uh, but it doesn't, but there are other symmetry presents which are known to be broken by hyperfine structure and the lamp shift. And so these have to be introduced perturbatively. Okay, then we will look at general relativistic space times of a photon. And so there are two uh, well known solutions in GR that model charge masses. These are the Reisner Weil Norsham space time and the Kerr Newman space time. Now, the Reisner Weil Norsham space time has a time like singularity with an associated charge, but no magnetic moment. The Kerr Newman space time has a cylindrical time like singularity with an associated charge and magnetic moment, uh, but it has causal pathologies, namely closed timeline curves, which make the solution somewhat unappealing. The zero gravity Kerr Newman space time is obtained by formally taking Newton's gravitational constant to zero in the Kerr Newman metric, and um, the resulting space time no longer has the causal pathologies of the Kerr Newman space time, but it still inherits the electromagnetic fields of the Kerr Newman space time, that is its associated charge and magnetic moment. Okay, then we'll look at Dirac's equation for an electron in ZGKN spacetime, and we want to investigate if the magnetic moment of the ring singularity can cause uh, hyperfine-like and lamb shift-like effects. Okay, so Dirac's equation for an electron in a proton's Coulomb field. So here is the Dirac equation for an electron in a proton's Coulomb field. We're using uh, this electromagnetic potential to model uh, the Coulomb field. Now, if we put the Dirac equation in Hamiltonian form, uh, then the discrete spectrum of this Hamiltonian is given by this formula here, which was first found by Sommerfeld. Uh, alpha here is the fine structure constant, or also known as Sommerfeld's constant. Um, okay, so the discrete spectrum is indexed by two integers, n and k. So n has to be a positive integer, one, two, three, et cetera. Uh, k has to be either a negative integer from minus one to minus n, or a positive integer from one to n minus one, but it can't be zero. Now, uh, the fact that the fine structure constant is small allows us to tailor expand the discrete spectrum in terms of powers of alpha. And notice that the second term in the Taylor expansion just corresponds to Bohr's energy levels. And so this implies that n, this integer in the discrete spectrum here, it corresponds to the principal quantum number. And we can relate the integer k back to the total and orbital angular momentum by this formula here. Okay, so again, here is the discrete spectrum and n corresponds to the principal quantum number and k can be related to the total and orbital and kilo momentum. Now we can use this identification to find a correspondence between the integers n and k and the usual spectroscopic notation. So for example, the ground state 1s1 half corresponds to n equals one and k equals minus one. Um, let's pay, let's look at these two states here, the 2s1 half and 2p1 half states. So they both correspond to principal quantum number two, uh, but one corresponds to k equals minus one and the other corresponds to k equals positive one. Now, um, notice that the discrete spectrum here is independent on the sign of k. And so these two states correspond to the same energy level, that is that they are degenerate. 
whereas the 2p3 half state corresponds to n equals 2 and k equals minus 2. And so this will be at a higher energy level. And it's the breaking of these degeneracies, which is known as fine structure. So to recap here in this picture, here we're looking at the first two principal quantum numbers in the hydrogen atom. So Bohr tells us that these two guys are at two different energy levels. Uh, the Dirac model shows that these energy levels shift slightly. The 2p1 half and 2s1 half states are at the same energy level, while the 2p3 half state is at a higher energy level. And so this was the fine structure that we just saw on the previous slide. Um, OK, but we know that the 2p1 half and 2s1 half states actually exist at different energy levels. And this is caused uh, by the Lamb shift, which is calculated um, by quantum electrodynamics perturbatively. So the Dirac model does not predict the Lamb shift. And furthermore, uh, there are other breaking of degeneracies known as hyperfine structure. So hyperfine structure is calculated by assigning a magnetic moment to the proton. And so the energy levels shift depending on whether the electron spin course is parallel or anti-parallel with the proton's uh, magnetic moment. Now, the Dirac model assumes just a point charge for the proton, so it also doesn't predict hyperfine structure as well. Okay, now we want to look at solutions in general relativity, which model a proton. Uh, so there are two well-known solutions in GR with charged masses. These are the reisner weyl nordstrom spacetime and the Kern-Newman spacetime. Mm -hmm. The reisner weyl nordstrom spacetime has a time-like singularity with a charge but no associated magnetic moment. And we will hear more about this case from Abru later, where they will insert a magnetic moment to the Hamiltonian by hand. Uh, the Kern-Newman spacetime has a time-like, a cylindrical time-like singularity that has both a charge and a magnetic moment associated with the ring singularity. However, the Kern-Newman spacetime has causal pathologies, namely closed time-like curves. The zero gravity Kern-Newman spacetime, or ZGKN spacetime, is obtained by taking Newton's gravitational constant to zero in the Kern-Newman metric, and it avoids the causal pathologies of the Kern-Newman spacetime while still inheriting the electromagnetic fields and the non-trivial topology of the Kern-Newman spacetime. Okay, so let's review. The Kern-Newman family of spacetimes is a three-parameter family of stationary axially symmetric solutions to the Einstein-Maxwell equations. These three parameters are the charge, the mass, and the angular momentum per unit mass per speed of light. And we want to model the hydrogen atom. And so we're going to take the charge Q to be the fundamental charge E, positive. Uh, we'll take the mass to be the mass of the proton. And we're going, to be, we're going to leave A as a parameter. Now, the empirical values of the proton's mass and charge put us well within the naked singularity sector of these space times. And so we are not talking about black holes here. We're talking about naked singularities. And we're thinking that this naked singularity is supposed to somehow model the proton. OK, so here is the current Newman metric in oblate spheroidal coordinates. These are the non-zero metric components. And these components are this. Uh, this isn't very illuminating. So let me just go to this picture here, which is supposed to geometrically tell us, uh, explain the current Newman space time. So um, uh, this picture here corresponds to a constant t and a constant phi snapshot of the current Newman space time. And let's just focus on the left half of the picture here. So the level sets of R are these ellipsoids. And these ellipsoids, as R shrinks to 0, they become degenerate along the disk containing the ring singularity. Uh, the level sets of theta are these hyperboloids here. They're orthogonal to the um, R equals constant ellipsoids. And let's notice that as you shrink the ring radius, as you shrink the ring, the ring radius singularity A to 0, the ellipsoids, they become spheres, and the hyperboloids, they become cones. And so in the limit as A goes to 0, we recover back the, you know, the usual spherical coordinates that we are familiar with. OK, the maximal analytic extension of the Kern Newman spacetime contains another sheet corresponding to values of r less than 0. So over here, the left-hand side corresponded to values of r bigger than 0, while the right-hand side corresponds to values of r less than 0. And um, these two space times, sorry, these two sheets, they are glued together along the disk containing the ring singularity. So they are glued here. And it's this gluing which gives um, the Kern Newman space time its non trivial topology. So, for example, if we started, if we took a, a curve starting in the r bigger than zero sheet, go through the disk, come back around to the, then we would come back around to the r less than zero sheet, and then go back, go through the disk again, then we would come through the r bigger than zero sheet 
and close up our curve, then this would be a curve which is not homotopic to a point. And so these space times have non-trivial fundamental group. OK. Uh, there are causal pathologies in the curve Newman space time, however. So there are closed time-like curves. This isn't too hard to see. Uh, you can show that there are values of R negative such that G phi phi is negative. And remember, phi is the parameter that corresponds to the killing field associated with the axial symmetry, right? These parameterize the S1 circles. So if you looked at a curve with constant phi for these values of R that, are, that make G phi phi negative, then this would correspond to a closed time-like curve. OK. Now let's look at the zero gravity Kerr Newman or ZGKN spacetime. And this is obtained by taking um, the formal limit of Newman's gravitational constant to zero in the Kerr Newman metric. So here is the Kerr Newman metric. And I've highlighted in red here everywhere where Newman's gravitational constant appears. And let's just take a look at the GTT and the GT phi term. So when we take Newton's gravitational constant to zero, mm. GTT just becomes minus C squared and GT phi just becomes zero. Um, now let's notice, let's look at the G phi, phi term here. So uh, when we set Newton's gravitational constant to zero, that guy just dies, right? And then what we're left with is something positive. And so we will not have closed time-like curves in the zero gravity curve Newman space time anymore. Um, so the resulting formal limit is this ZGKN metric. Uh, there are no closed time-like curves because G phi phi is always positive. The electromagnetic fields remain because they are independent of uh, Newton's gravitational constant. And the non-trivial topology remains as well. So this picture that we had for the Kern-Newman spacetime, we also have it for the zero gravity Kern-Newman spacetime as well. OK. Now let's look at Dirac's equation for an electron in the ZGKN spacetime. So when working with the Dirac equation, we're going to switch to the plus minus 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 signature convention. So this is the metric uh, for ZGKN with this signature convention. Here is the Dirac equation on curved spacetime. So notice that we're using the covariant derivative um, for spinners here. And the electric and here is the electromagnetic potential. Now, uh, remember that this potential does not depend on Newton's gravitational constant. So this is the same electromagnetic potential that one finds in the Kern Newman spacetime as well. Now let's just make a remark. If we send A to zero, then formally the metric approaches the Minkowski metric, and the um, electromagnetic potential approaches that of just a Coulomb potential. So in some sense, as you're taking A to zero, you're recovering back the usual problem of the electron and a proton Coulomb field in Minkowski space. OK, putting the Dirac equation in Hamiltonian form, we have the following theorems by Shadia and Michael, first proved in 2014. The Dirac Hamiltonian on ZGKN is essentially self-adjoint, so there's only one self-adjoint extension. Uh, the spectrum is symmetric about zero. This is interesting because this does not happen for the usual um, Dirac equation on Minkowski space for the cooling potential. So there is something about the double sheetedness of the zero gravity Kerr Newman space time that proves that allows you to have a, a symmetric spectrum about zero. Uh, the continuous spectrum contains a gap. That, wasn't, that's, that also is true for uh, the Dirac equation on Minkowski space plus the Coulomb potential. And finally, they proved that the discrete spectrum is non-empty, provided the ring radius satisfies these certain um, conditions here. And so they left as an open problem to characterize this discrete spectrum. And so um, what we have, or what we are preparing right now, is that the discrete spectrum should be countably infinite. This will be indexed by three integers, and it accumulates to plus or minus mc squared provided the ring radius A satisfies the same conditions that it did on the previous slide. OK, and lastly, I want to compare the radial Hamiltonian for Minkowski plus Coulomb to the radial Hamiltonian for ZGKN. And um, the first thing I think we should note is that if you send A to 0, then the ZGKN radial Hamiltonian will approach that of the Minkowski plus Coulomb potential. Uh, lambda, it plays the role of k, that integer k that we saw earlier. Uh, you can see that here, so this is where lambda appears in our radial Hamiltonian, and this is where it appears in the Hamiltonian from Minkowski plus Coulomb. And kappa, it plays the role of m sub j, and it appears in our Hamiltonian here and here. Um, now notice that m sub j, it doesn't appear in the radial Hamiltonian 
for the Minkowski plus the Coulomb potential. And so we think that this term, this kappa appearing in our radial Hamiltonian will help us, will possibly produce some hyperfine like effects. And so our ultimate goal is to see how much of this picture here can get reproduced by the Dirac model on, or the Dirac on ZGKN model. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Let's thank uh, Eric Lin for his presentation. And uh, uh, time for questions and discussion. Go ahead, please. I have a comment, but I will wait for other people first to ask their questions. I have a quick question. What was the lambda in this last slide? So the lambda here, so the lambda, you put the Hamiltonian uh, can be split by separation of variables. And so the lambda corresponds to the eigenvalue of the angular Hamiltonian. And K also corresponds to the eigenvalue of the angular Hamiltonian. So we were just using lambda for this, this um, variable. So it's just one of the parameters that uh, characterizes all the eigenvalues? Yeah. Uh-huh. Okay. Yeah, okay. If at the moment, no other question. Uh, a comment was concerning uh, the remark when you let A go to zero, Eric. Uh, okay. You said then uh, you get eta, the Minkowski metric. Uh, that's true locally, but you have two sheets, right? So you get yeah. uh -huh. two copies of Minkowski, one for R bigger than zero, one for R less than zero. And the R less than zero sheet also has a different charge, right? So yeah. that means mm -hmm. in this sense, you actually have two copies of the Sommerfeld spectrum, but one comes with a minus sign. So the bound states are all in the negative. And in another case, that's the normal textbook thing. So the, you have somehow the symmetry also there. No? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, so yeah, so in this, you know, in, so when you guys were able to prove that the spectrum is symmetric about zero, then, you know, if we assume that A goes to zero, we recover the spectrum for Minkowski space, what we would expect to recover are two copies, one yes, corresponding right. to the positive one and one corresponding to the negative one. That's right. no? uh, uh, basically, uh, uh, one is uh, flip-flop at, uh, uh, at zero uh, of the other. No? So in this sense, two copies. No, mm -hmm. no images of it. So it all fits together and uh, up to the quantitative evaluation of the fine details. <laughs> <laughs> which is a major effort, yeah. Very good, very good, very nice talk. Hmm? Any other uh, questions or comments? If not, let's thank uh, Eric again for a wonderful presentation. And Michael, you have the reins too. For yeah. the in fact, we have uh, uh, just about two minutes left here, but Annegret may already put up the share screen. And I see Felix has joined us. Hi, Felix. Hi, nice to meet you. As I said, I had a meeting. This is why I couldn't come earlier. Don't worry, I wasn't there coming in in time either, but I had problems with the Zoom link. It just wasn't there. <laughs> so Shadi sent me some special link and then I could get in. Okay. Ah, I can see that. Can everybody see on a great slides? So I see people nodding here. <clears throat> I'm just waiting a little bit to start properly.
Yeah, okay, I think just a few seconds. So, ooh, what was that? <laughs> so let me welcome our next speaker, who is Annegret Burcher at the Radboud University in Nijmegen. And uh, she's going to present also joint work with Shani and myself on the second Yankee identity for space times with time like singularities. Please, Annegret. Well, thank you, Michael, for um, inviting me and also Shadi for inviting me to this session and uh, well, allowing uh, me to present uh, the new results of our uh, work on the second Bianchi identity. So it's about studying the second Bianchi identity for space times that uh, have a, per a certain kind of uh, time like singularities. And I will first talk about uh, what is the motivation for studying this problem and then different aspects of it. So the motivation comes from trying to understand uh, the motion of charged massive particles in general relativity. And the standard textbook um, uh, approach to this is uh, via test particles. And that involves basically just uh, studying um, the, mo the motion along geodesics uh, well, when the particles are uncharged. And the point is that uh, these particles then have basically no effect on the space-time geometry because they, they don't exist. They're just test particles. However, there are another approach um, is uh, going back to, to, to while um, Einstein, Ilfen, Hoffman, and Infel student Wallace around uh, 1940, which is uh, modeling these particles, not, uh, not as uh, just uh, basically non-existent, but is modeling them as uh, singularities in a, in, a, in a general relativistic theory, um, and namely as uh, one-dimensional time-like singularities. So the idea is here, that uh, we consider the Einstein-Maxwell equations away from the singularities. And the second Bia Bianchi identity, uh, which is a geometric uh, differential identity, will then imply um, the divergence-free form of the energy momentum tensor, which should then determine the motion of these particles. And you can view these singularities, time-like singularities, essentially as sources and sinks of this electromagnetic field. Now, this has... Uh, this, this is an old, uh, old idea, basically, but um, we're going to review this from a more rigorous mathematical perspective now. And so our, um, our goal is to consistently formulate a, a joint initial value problem for this idea, which means uh, modeling the motion of these massive charged particles, and at the same time also the evolution of these electromagnetic and gravitational fields that they generate. And there are several mathematical sub subtleties involved in this problem. And um, I'm going to briefly discuss them. So the first one is a more of a geometric problem is kind of what, what should these uh, time-like singularities mean geometrically. And um, there's one uh, approach to um, model them essentially as interior boundaries of the space time. And um, not just any kind of boundary, but the uh, time-like boundary with, uh, with certain regular initial data, uh, with cer certain regular boundary data. And this goes back to an idea of Bray, but uh, it has also been studied already in, in different contexts. I will say a little bit more later about that. So this is a geometric interpretation of what these singularities should mean. Then that there's an analytical side to this um, problem, which is basically what we want to do first, is understand uh, the second Bianca identity in this weak setting, of course, as I said, away from the singularities, it's, it's just a pointwise differential identity, but what do you do if you have a boundary? And so this requires us to, to study or derive or define a weak formulation of this second Bianchi identity, and then try to understand when it holds. And this is the main part of my talk um, today. And then of course, this is just a geometry and analysis, um, basically. We also want to give this a physical meaning and namely we want to understand for what kind of matter models um, satisfy these constraints that but both they are modeling suitable um, singularities as well as uh, satisfying this uh, weak Bianchi identity. And this requires us to, to, to uh, study electromagnetic vacuum norms that are different from Maxwell. And I'll also say more about this later. And uh, so the key question for this talk will be, well, under which conditions on the metric uh, of the space-time does this weak, and sec weak, does a weak second Bianchi identity hold? And first, of course, I have to define what it is and even is. So it's uh, also about deriving a sensible notion of it. And the related questions is what I had mentioned uh, is, uh, 
comes up in the same vein. Um, what are admissible singularities that we want to study and which electromagnetic series are suitable for deriving such an identity. And uh, initially we have studied this in the static sphere for static spherically symmetric space times as a single time-like uh, singularity in the center. And um, uh, this, uh, we have already initiated this uh, earlier, but uh, we have a recent preprint um, from April. And I'm going to present the results about this now. And so the outline of my talk is as follows. I'm, um, I'm essentially addressing all these three points that I mentioned before. I first want to talk about these uh, viewing these time-like singularities as regular inner boundaries of a space-time. And then I will talk about deriving uh, distribution of the Anke identity and establishing criteria for when it holds. And then I'll give some applications to electrostatics. OK, so let's start with the geometry. So the simplest kind of example of a, of a space-time is a, is a time-like singularity. You can view as a Schwarzschild solution with negative mass. And um, it's a spherically symmetric static and has a positively flat space-time with a negative uh, total mass, well, the constant m. In contrast to the black hole version, we have actually a global coordinate system. And uh, similarly, we have a curvature blow up at the center. Here is r to the minus six. And at r equals zero, we have a time-like singularity, which uh, in, this, in a different context later, we'll see it's a sphere with, uh, or it's a cylinder with zero area, sphere with zero area. And so the question is, well, what is the geometric relevance of this, uh, of such, of this uh, negative mass Schwarzschild solution? And, uh, and how can we use it for, for our uh, approach? And so to understand the, the meaning of the mass, um, I'll give here some well-known um, Riemannian results. Uh, so for Riemannian three manifolds uh, with non-negative scalar curvature and ADM mass M. Uh, the relation of the mass to certain geometric equalities and inequalities. So the number one here is um, the positive mass theorem, which essentially says that if this manifold has no boundary, uh, then, um, then either the mass is positive or if it's zero, it's exactly Euclidean space or it's isometric to its uh, Euclidean space. The second one is the, the Penrose, the Riemannian Penrose inequality which basically says, well, we have a boundary, which is a compact boundary, which is outer minimizing minimal surface. And in this case, with a total area A, and in this case, the mass will be greater than a constant um, related to this area. Uh, and if it's a equality, then it's exactly the, the positive mass uh, Schwarzschild solution with this particular mass, well, the exterior part of it. And so the, the third inequality, that there exists is uh, the one that, again, we have a boundary, a compact boundary. And uh, we assume that each of these connected components is a zero area singularity. I'll say more about what this is later. And in this case, uh, there is also an uh, analogous um, inequality, equality. Uh, this is, well, I call this a zero area singularity inequality, which is due to Bray and Bray and Charigi, um, which says that the mass is always greater or equal to the the SAS mass and with equality if and only if the, the, the space-time is isometric to the negative mass Schwarzschild solution. So we essentially, uh, the mass describes that either we are flat or we have a black hole or we have this uh, naked singularity. And uh, this, this is kind of going to give, a, well, this is the geometric um, meaning of how we can view this mass and this singularity. And uh, I will explain how we use this in our framework and what uh, these terms are even mean, what this uh, zero area singularity in the mass means. So I'll try to keep this a little bit simple here, but um, so essentially what we want to study is we want to st study space times with certain admissible time-like singularities. And the admissibility comes from the interpretation as a, as a zero area singularity in the Riemannian sense due to Bray. And so we assume that in these space-like slices, we have a, a regular zero area singularity. And moreover, that the, um, the boundary data can be interpreted as Bray's uh, notion of CES mass. And this should be negative then. And uh, since I said earlier, we are only studying the static spherically symmetric uh, case, and this is gonna be a little bit easier. Um, 
what what is such a zero area singularity? It's essentially a conformal extension in a suitable way um, with a conformal factor here of this phi bar. And the extension is the sigma bar in the Riemannian setting. And uh, we are going to view this also in a space-time setting. So in order to make sure that we have such a regular singularity, we assume that our space-time metric can be written in these spatial conformally flat coordinates. And the idea is that we blow up this singularity at the center or the central line uh, into, into a cylinder, but the area will still be zero because R is, is, well, is the area radius. So we assume we have this uh, form of the, of, we can write the metric in this form. And uh, one can show that uh, if the cumulative mass functions has this particular kind of asymptotics at the center, so M naught plus M one times R and so on with M naught negative, then this coordinate transformation is always possible. And moreover, uh, one, can it, one can show that, or actually Bray showed that, that the task mass in this, uh, in this spherically symmetric setting is actually just the limit of the Hawking mass. And that in this case is just our bare mass M naught. And uh, at R equals infinity, we'll get the ADM mass. So we kind of, um, so we see we can interpret our um, time-like singularities in this setting um, and also assign it a suitable boundary data. But we already had to make this restriction that we have these spatially conformally flat coordinates. So this is the geometric part of it. Um, and now I'm trying to do some analysis. Now I'm going to describe how we want to prove a second Bianchi identity um, for such space times. And the idea, of course, will be that, that we study manifolds with boundary, with these particular kinds of boundaries. And so just to recap again now, so we have essentially an extended manifold M bar, which is diffeomorphic to R4. And in the interior, so except that the center and the central line, um, this is just a smooth Lorentzian metric or sufficiently smooth. Um, could be C3, uh, which implies then that the second Bianchi identity holds pointwise everywhere, uh, except that the singularity at the boundary itself. And so we have this one dimensional time like uh, uh, SAS boundary, which is kind of blown up to this uh, row equals row naught. And uh, the question remains is then, well, sorry, uh, how can we? Um, how can we view this Bianchi identity now in this uh, for this such a manifold with boundary? And here I'm just going to present a, a kind of a heuristic approach of how how can we derive him such a can candidate? And in order to do so, we assume that both the metric and the metric uh, well the Einstein tensor extends smoothly actually to the boundary, so they're actually smooth everywhere. Then what would we get? Is of course that we integrate over the whole manifold um, the Bianchi identity holds pointwise. Uh, we just integrate. And then uh, we use integration by parts. We use Stokes theorem to get a boundary term. But because we are smooth and everything is fine, this, this boundary term is zero. And so we are just left with this, uh, with this uh, right term here, which is essentially just differentiating the test vector field. So this is in the smooth setting, um, but of course, what we are assuming now is that, that this term here is not well-defined, that actually the metric and or, or both, the Einstein tensor do not uh, extend smoothly to the, to the boundary. And so in this case, um, we approach the boundary by namely looking at, uh, at, um, at uh, looking at a cylinder uh, with a slightly bigger radius, uh, so rho naught plus epsilon, so rho naught plus ex exactly the blown up singularity. So we let this um, radius shrink. And uh, instead of uh, the boundary itself, we just consider this limit, which is um, what you have seen here, basically. And uh, th so this is what we call the inhomogeneous version of the Bianchi identity. And then we show we assume that uh, the twice contracted second Bianchi identity holds weakly if this limit is zero. And this um, this motivation for assuming that it's zero, it's of course that we we assume that this is a time-like singularity with which corresponds to the zero area singularities. 
So this, this should vanish. So this is our definition for um, a weak, uh, where well, a second Bianchi identity with a, with a regular weak time-like singularity. And uh, if I want to state this boldly, what we, what we expect is that if the boundary um, is such an admissible time-like singularity in the SAS sense on its slices, then this second Bianchi identity should always hold weakly. But we have only shown this result in a particular setting. So I'm already, I think I have to go a bit faster now. <laughs> so we have shown this result um, in a static, for static spherically symmetric space times, as again, as I said, in order to even have these admissible time-like singularities, we have to assume this um, coordinate transformation to spatially conformally flat coordinates. And we assume um, some conditions on the geometry, so on the conformal factor and this uh, metric component gamma. And if they dec decay sufficiently fast, as we approach the singularity, the blown up singularity, then we can show that the second Bianchi identity holds weakly. And the basic idea is of course, just uh, doing these limits and again, using the Stokes theorem in a suitable sense. And we can also uh, derive a criterion for the original coordinates. So the area radius coordinates, if, um, if alpha and beta are, well, alpha, uh, beta is minus alpha, then one can write this directly in terms of the cumulative mass function if it has this, this particular extension with, again, a negative bare mass. So now we have kind of seen that, uh, well, we can make sense of a distributional Bianchi identity, but we still don't know, does it, is there any electromagnetic theory which, which actually um, fulfills these criteria. And so this is the last part of my uh, talk. And so the, the, the standard example that, would you, that you would pick and that Eric had already shown it is the, well, the rice nobel nordheim solution. However, if you, sh if you pick that, um, well, you, you consider the super extremal case because we wanna study naked singularities. Uh, however, this has uh, infinite self energy and uh, related to that very severe curvature singularity. Now, not to the r to the minus six, but r to the minus eight blow up. And one can actually show that also the corollary that I, that I shown before does not apply. And in fact, one can also directly show that the Bianchi identity that, I have de that we have defined is not satisfied weakly. So the rice novel Nordstrom is uh, not, not, a, not a very good candidate. However, one can uh, find a, other uh, electromagnetic theories via, via an action and a Lagrangian. And this is basically just deriving the Maxwell equations uh, through a uh, variational argument and obtaining them as uh, all the Lagrange equations of, of this action. And the question is, of course, it then translates to, well, what is a suitable Lagrangian? So the admissible, what is an admissible Lagrangian in order to obtain an uh, admissible time-like singularity? And I will just skip this. So, um, so there are some, some standard criteria that we want to satisfy, but the last two are the ones that are actually not satisfied by the reasonable Nordstrom. And this is that we want to obtain a finite electrostatic field energy and a sufficiently mild curvature singularity in order for the second Bianchi identity to hold weakly. And one can show, well, Maxwell doesn't satisfy that, but there are other series which do. And the basic result then is that for these kind of admissible reduced Hamiltonians, we can show that the second Bianchi identity is still satisfied weakly. And uh, well, this just follows from the corollary that I've shown before. Okay, I'll skip this. And just uh, say at the end that, well, what have we shown? So we have kind of established a, a more general framework to, to understand what are admissible time-like singularities. And those are then the ones that are related to obtaining a weak second Bianchi identity. And we have obtained uh, rigorous uh, theorems uh, in the special case of static spherically symmetric space times with, a, uh, with one time like singularity and uh, certain, per certain electromagnetic models. And of course, still a lot of questions left. Thank you. Thank you, Anne Grill. And please unmute yourself, everyone, and give her a clap. A wonderful talk. So unfortunately, time is very advanced. So maybe we have time for one quick question. OK, 
Okay, that does not seem to be the case. After all, it was a very clear talk anyhow. Okay, so in that case, let's give her a hand again. And I pass the ball back to Shadi, who will introduce our next speaker. Yes, Sidant, if you could please. Uh... Yes. I always have myself muted when I want to share the screen and it's, can you guys hear me and see my screen? Okay, good. So um, thanks to the organizers for having me as a part of this great meeting. I should begin with a disclaimer actually, I will really have not, nothing to say about gender relativity and as far as I can say, no immediate implications. But I'll say something about um, a particular kind of scattering experiment, who, which has implications for some approaches to quantum gravity. And that's why I chose precisely those aspects of this problem. And the entire talk is based on this paper, or at least elements of this paper. So it's a very recent one. And for those who would like to jump into this area, this would be a great starting point it, because it reviews um, a lot of the details which you wouldn't find easily. Anyways, and this was written with my colleague Marcus Nood. Uh, let me dive right in. So I'm talking about a scattering experiment and this is a sketch of how the experiment is more or less conducted in the lab. So we have in mind a single particle that's prepared in some quantum state or wave function psi zero at a certain time that you call time zero. And uh, there are detectors placed on a geometrical surface dou G. And what we are interested in is the distribution of the times at which clicks are seen. So in any run of the experiment, you see only one click because there is only one particle. But when you repeat the experiment again and again, preparing the particle every time in the same quantum state, you get a distribution of detection times. It can also be called arrival times and so on. At the end of the day, the object of interest is this probability density P of tau, which is basically the distribution or probability density of arrival times. Now, the minimal inputs to calculating this at the moment are this initial quantum state psi zero and the geometry of the boundary given by the surface. And so far, everybody would agree that this quantity uh, needs to be normalized as written below. So if you integrate the density of overall detection times, it will go to one. Uh, sometimes it's nice to generalize it a little bit and add a so-called non-detection probability, which I wrote P infinity there. That's basically the fraction of experiments in which the particle was not detected and you wouldn't be able to define an arrival time in these cases. Anyways, um, so this, uh, well, I, I'm jumping ahead of myself, but this has been a huge- what is TOF standing for the abbreviation? Oh, I'm sorry, TOF stands, stands for time of flight. Time of flight, thanks. Yeah, sorry, I should have uh, at least written it once <laughs> explicitly. Well, so um, um, it's a whole talk in itself to tell people that it's a real problem for standard quantum mechanics to come up with a definite answer for this P of tau. There is much literature on it. The shortest way to uh, explain this issue or to suggest that there is an issue is to look at the literature and you would see many competing predictions and they are not equivalent to each other. They don't agree with each other. And for such a simple single particle scattering experiment, this is very telling. And I'm going to focus on a very particular class of approaches that are very popular given the amount of physicists in, uh, investing in it. And I would like to highlight severe physical problems with them. That's the content of this talk, okay? So how do we make predictions in quantum mechanics? I mean, if you look at the textbook, it's made by means of observables or so-called, I mean, these are operators, uh, uh, on a certain Hilbert space. And well, if you already know what the operator is for a certain problem of interest, then it's just a matter of calculation. But here we are faced with constructing the operator itself. And there are not many good guidelines how to go about it. 
Well, one of the early ideas goes back to Arno van Bohm in the 1960s and later Powell in 1962. And they did basically what uh, one is advised to do, right? Uh, appeal to the correspondence principle. Go to classical mechanics, pick up the function that's uh, the classical representation of the quantity of interest and put hats on it. So here we're looking at the arrival time of a particle and the simplest circumstance is to look at a free particle moving on a line. And if Z and P are the initial position and momentum of the particle, then this, form, this expression here would be the classical arrival time expression, except for the fact that it's not completely correct. But this is what most people start with in, in this business. And here, of course, I should mention, I have set H bar and M and sigma, which is the width of the initial wave function to one, so that the expressions are a little nicer to read. The correct formula for an arbitrary initial position and momentum of a free particle is written below in the footnote there, right? I mean, for example, the formula above would not work if the particle is moving to the left and you would have a negative arrival time according to the formula. So the correct formula is impossible to quantize. It's, it's a very nasty function of the position and momentum, but well, one could just say good luck to people who want to put hats in this case. Anyway, starting with this formula, we are still, beginning to see all the uh, only we are beginning to see the face of the problems the first of these is you know z and p don't commute so you will have to specify some orderings to well the point is you will not have a unique operator starting from this formula and what arnold bohm did is do something natural in quantum mechanics is to symmetrize the the z and p orderings there was a related idea by Grot, Rovelli, and Tate in 96, which is another kind of ordering. And I would say the list here can be practically endless. In any case, uh, these operators had one uh, interesting feature which led to much interest in them, namely that for the free Hamiltonian, which is P squared over 2M, uh, these operators commute with the free Hamiltonian in the way you would expect a time operator and a Hamiltonian to commute as people would expect them to commute. And this suggested that that might be a possibility of an energy time uncertainty relation. I will say more about this in the next slides. Uh, there was already an observation in 1933 by Pauli that you know Hamiltonians which are bounded from below cannot, uh, uh, well, the correct uh, statement of the theorem is two self-adjoint operators, one of which is bounded from below wouldn't satisfy such an identity. So you know the, the, you, the, we, are, we are familiar with the position and momentum commutation relation, and both of them are unbounded from below as operators, right? In this case, P squared is bounded from below, and uh, this theorem basically means that this T hat is not a self-adjoint operator, okay? Um, that's what I just said. So they are not self-adjoint, so they wouldn't define observables in the sense of Dirac and von Neumann that we are used to in quantum mechanics. And this is just the least of its problems, if you ask me. Uh, for me, one striking aspect is that this operator has negative eigenvalues, and this leads to interpretational problems and even problematic predictions, uh, to put it more strongly. Uh, but before we come to what are the problematic predictions, what is an arrival time distribution from this uh, starting point? Uh, given that it's not self-adjoint, one has to sort of appeal to more generalized notions of observables in quantum mechanics, namely that of positive operator valued measures. And after some work, um, this operator leads to a, to a well-defined density, arrival time density, which I've written here. It's a slightly mouthful of a formula, but it's based on the Fourier transform of the initial wave function, as you can see here, and suitable integral that you need to compute. Uh, so that's the formula. Moving on, uh, uh, this operator uh, leads to a distribution which has to be normalized over negative eigenvalues, negative arrival times, I mean. And that's very weird if you ask, if you think from an experimental point of view, what does negative arrival time mean here? But uh, that's how the math plays here. So there was a suggestion by some authors that maybe interpret the negative arrival times as the non-detection probability. So define literally by hand uh, non-detection probability, which is the area of this density for all negative arrival times. But the moment you do that, you have to basically redefine your formulas for computing expectation values. So you cannot use the 
standard quantum mechanical formulas anymore. If you if you see, because uh, these expectation values depend on negative eigenvalue contributions as well. Uh, by the way, this formula would have been problematic by itself anyway. So this formula of taking the operator and sandwiching it between the wave function, because there is a nice expression you can write down for this expectation value that I've written below. This formula is not important, but uh, this formula helps you to see one very befuddling consequence, namely that if the initial wave function is a real wave function, so think of just a Gaussian wave function, which is just real, then the expectation value would be zero of this operator. And this is true for any real wave function. And that's very weird because uh, vanishing of expected value of the arrival time means the particle arrives instantaneously in every single run of the experiment. Um, coming to this ener time energy uncertainty relation, which basically uh, kept this kind of research program alive for a long time, I, I would say that uh, this cannot be sustained either. And the reason is, for many wave functions, these second moments of this operator, which you need in the uncertainty inequality, cannot be defined. They, they are not just finite quantities. So the wave function has to have a certain moment, certain decay at around p equals zero for this, uh, you know, this delta t to be well defined. And that uh, then there was a suggestion: why don't we restrict our attention to only those states which fulfill this kind of condition? But I must. I'm sorry to say that this would exclude even very reasonable wave functions like Gaussians, for whom you would be very interested to know what the arrival times are. Um, and then if you have to redefine your expectation values formula by removing the negative arrival time contributions, they will anyway not satisfy the uncertainty inequality that you want at the end of the day. So, I would say that the uncertainty relation which many authors claim is substantiated by this kind of program really is untrue and that's not hard to explain. Uh, the same distribution was derived uh, a few years later by Kijowski and this is a very original attempt to get at a quantum mechanical prediction. What he did was he didn't start with an operator but he started with reasonable axioms for what the quantity of interest, uh, the quantity of interest might satisfy. So he initially looked at freely moving wave functions, wave functions which in momentum space just evolved by this uh, phase factor, right? So simple free motion wave functions. He went a little three dimensional, namely he had in mind a pla pl planar surface. So he has a coordinate system and without loss of generality, just think of the plane Z equals L and he, he looked at arrival time distributions which have a certain form. So this F is a bilinear form and he was looking for, you know, this is what quantum mechanical uh, probabilities eventually look like. They're bilinear in the quantum state. So he was looking for a suitable F and of course <laughs> they will not pop out of thin air. So one has to put some reasonable axioms to get at them. And these are in his opinion, reasonable axioms to get, get to an F. You can see that he also needs negative arrival times for his program to work out. And this unfortunately has been much passed over in silence, as I was just saying. Uh, in any case, these axioms are not sufficient to give you a unique F, which is not, uh, you know, which is usually also the case. But he noticed that a particular F that I've written down here uh, is nice because uh, it has a nice relation to other Fs in this class. Namely that uh, this F, if you compute the expectation value, including the negative arrival times, it has the same expectation value as any other F in the class. So F zero is the special F that we just found. And these two identities hold true. And finally, the com complete expression for the F, uh, uh, for, the, for the distribution. So I only wrote down what F is here. But if you plug it back into the formula for the arrival time distribution, you end up with a concrete expression that I've written below. And you can convince yourself, if you remember the expression two slides down, this looks basically what Aharnov Bohm had found in their own way in the one dimensional context. Now, uh, this approach also basically shares essentially all the problems that I was saying with Aharnov Bohm one, and that's all right, but there is another thing I would like to highlight here, namely 
that so this F0 is supposed to be a guy which uniquely fell out of uh, these properties. Uh, Vidant, uh, sorry, sorry to interrupt, but uh, you're running out of time. So could you please yeah, wrap up? Yeah, I'm done. So I will just show you one last picture and then. Okay. Um, all right, so, so this is most of the uh, things that I had to say. The whole problem is we are still talking about free motion and then the, the interesting things are to generalize this to non-trivial potentials. And the problem that one of the generalizations of this approach that was suggested is an expression that I've written here, where you know one ad hoc, in a very ad hoc way puts the free evolution operator between the inner products before. And this is no good because one can show that this prescription fails to be gauge invariant. So if you were to apply such a formula to situations involving magnetic field and just a constant magnetic field for that matter. So I had a so I had a quick example for you. So there was a constant magnetic field pointing in the Z direction. And you know, if you, if you try to compute some curves uh, from this formula, you can show that for two different vector potential choices for the same magnetic field, you get totally two different predictions. And worse still, in certain gauges, this distribution even fails to be normalizing. So there is just no way one can use this to move on in this project. And I, I normally come here and say there are other ways to do arrival times, but I, I'm particularly a fan of the approach using Bohmian trajectories. And those from the very beginning have really none of these pathologies. And they're not very widely studied in the literature. And that's a pity given that some of the most popular candidates have very basic issues. So with that, I think I'll just wrap up. And if there are any questions, I'm happy to address. Well, first, let's uh, unmute ourselves and thank Sidan for their presentation. And now, please, the uh, floor is open for questions and comments. Well, I have a very quick question uh, mm -hmm. because at the end now you just flushed uh, or flashed the slides at us. Can you show the, the flux formula again, where you said uh, you are particularly fond of yeah, this one? And so just explain briefly. So this is the quantum probability current. Exactly. So, so this is another formula for computing arrival times, which is not based on observables as the other ones. And here the idea is to just take the probability current of quantum mechanics and integrate it against, an, against the surface of the detector. But I must always warn here that this shouldn't be looked at as a formula on its own, like uh, as a standalone formula. I always think of it as a special case of the, of the formula that you get in Bohmian mechanics using physical trajectories of the theory. But anyway, this is a gauge invariant prescription. That's the point I wrote down this formula. Uh, yeah. Thanks. This wouldn't suffer from problems as the other expressions I showed you. Any other questions or comments? If not, let's thank Siddhant again. And it's uh, over to you, Michael. Thank you, Shari. And uh, so I think, uh, Felix, you are the next speaker, if I'm seeing that correctly. Very well. Let me make that full screen. The full screen, where is this? Full build modus, here we go. Okay, can you see it in full screen and can you hear me? I can hear you. And but uh, doesn't look full screen to me. Ah, I, I we had this problem a few times already, not with me as a speaker, but with several speakers in our seminar. I don't know, is it okay like this? I just yeah, one can at least else please. I could also simply go here back to standard mode. And then make is this that's better? better? That's better. 
Okay, and then of course you see something up here, but this doesn't really, shouldn't really matter. Okay, very good. Yeah, we just have a couple of seconds left, so I think I can start. So we're very happy to have as our next speaker, the one and only Felix Finster from the University of Regensburg. And he is going to speak to us about causal fermion systems, classical gravity and beyond. Please, Felix. Yes, first of all, Michael, thanks a lot for the invitation. It's a great pleasure and honor to be here. Well, my talk is a bit, little bit a different topic because it's not just classical gravity, but it goes beyond. Also, I don't know if you're familiar with causal fermion systems already. In case you are not, let's see, but how can I? Aha, that was just, okay. <clears throat> so in general words, uh, a causal fermion system is an approach to fundamental physics where we also work with a different model of space-time. So space-time is not a manifold, but a different mathematical setup. And the physical equations are formulated in this other setup in generalized space-times. Okay, and the results are, I mean, what, was, what we already did in detail is to work out the so-called continuum limit. So in this limiting case, one gets back to a classical space-time, Minkowski space or Lorentzian manifold and one gets classical fields, say Maxwell field, gravitational field, coupled to a second quantized Dirac field. One gets the interactions of the standard model, so electroweak and strong, also general relativity and quantum mechanics. <clears throat> There's another limiting case which we are working on right now, which is based on what we call microscopic mixing, where one gets, in fact, quantum field theory, second quantized fermionic on bosonic fields. And I might say a few words at the very end of my talk. But of course, here I want to focus mainly on general relativity. <clears throat> and But first of all, let me give an introduction. And unfortunately, giving a self-contained introduction would take too much time. So this is impossible in 20 minutes. But if you want to get an introduction, I would recommend you to go to our websites where you find videos and uh, websites which explain different aspects for mathematicians, physicists, and so on. <clears throat> so what I, the only thing I can do here is just give you a few ingredients and tell you a little bit what the underlying structures are. So one ingredient is that we describe the physical system by an ensemble of spinorial one particle wave functions, say psi n. And the idea is that they should describe the matter of the system, say Dirac particles, but also include the Dirac C. So we take this picture of a Dirac C literally. So all these occupied states from the Dirac C are included here. So then one has an ensemble of wave functions. So this is a complex vector space. This comes with a scalar product. So we have a Hilbert space. And moreover, at every space-time point, the wave functions are endowed with an indefinite inner product, which we denote like this. And out of this ensemble, we now form observable quantities. I mean, what is observable is like densities and correlations of these wave functions. And in the simplest case, one chooses an orthonormal basis, and then the matrix entries of an operator f of x are simply given by these by the inner product of these wave functions at a given space-time point. This gives a linear operator on the Hilbert space with certain properties, which I will mention on the next slide. And then the system or the, the basic object is a measure on this set of linear operators. So the picture is that the support of this measure, these are all the space-time points. And moreover, the measure gives you a way to um, measure the, the volume of space-time region. So you should really think of it as a space-time volume, which can be determined by this measure. Okay, here, now in the, on my next slide, just quickly, let's see, so, okay. Just quickly, the abstract definition. So the structure is we have a Hilbert space. Then we are given a parameter n, so-called spin dimension. Then we consider all the linear operators on the Hilbert space, which are symmetric, have finite rank, 
and have at most n positive and at most n negative eigenvalues. So this is a set of linear operators. And then we consider a measure on this set of linear operators. I mean, you have like a picture just so you have uh, something concrete in mind. So this yellow set is now the set of linear operators with these properties. So this is like a star shaped region in the set of all in the space of all linear operators. Well, and then the measure determines a certain subset like the support of the measure and this could be continuous, it could be discrete. So we can describe continuous and discrete space times. Good, and now we set up a variational principle for the measure. And well, let me just do this quickly. I don't have time to enter the details. So the way it works is as follows. Suppose we take two operators in curly F. So two points there, then we can multiply the two operators together. And then we get an operator, which again has finite rank, namely rank at most to N, but which is no longer a symmetric operator because taking the adjoint just flips the order of the two operators. But we can compute all the non-trivial eigenvalues and they are in general complex. So this means we get two N complex numbers for any pair of points. Well, and then we form a Lagrangian by taking the absolute values of these complex numbers, taking their differences, taking the square, summing over all the eigenvalues. So this gives us a non-negative number, which depends on the pair of <clears throat> operators X and Y. Now, this is our Lagrangian. We integrate this with respect to the measure. And this gives us a non-negative number, the action. And then the idea is, or the action principle is to minimize this action under variations of the measure under certain constraints. And these constraints are needed in order for this whole variation principle to be mathematically well-defined. I think there's no time entering the, the constraints. This is not important for what follows. But let me explain a little bit the structure of this Lagrangian. Namely, this is tied to a causal structure, which comes up here. This is why it's called causal Fermi system, causal Lagrangian. And this works as follows. Suppose we take now two points in the support of the measure. This means two space-time points. Then we can multiply them together, compute the eigenvalues just as before. And then we can make the distinction between real eigenvalues or eigenvalues in the complex plane. And this gives us a distinction between space-like and time-like. So in this way, there is like a spectral definition of causality. And the, the Lagrangian is compatible with this structure in the sense that if you take two points which are space-like separated in this sense, then the Lagrangian vanishes. So this means points with space-like separations, they do not interact with each other. So and this comes up here in a rather abstract way but one can verify in limiting cases that it really gives back the usual notion of causality on a Lorentzian manifold, say. Okay, now what about this con continuum limit? This is, as I said at the beginning, what has been worked out in detail. What we do is that we form this ensemble of wave functions by taking solutions of a Dirac equation. This means we take a Lorentzian manifold, set up the Dirac equation, consider the solutions. And then one gets a corresponding causal Fermi system, of course, of a specific form. And then we can ask the question, do we have a minimizer of the causal action principle? Or more generally, do we have a critical point of the causal action in the limiting case when we remove an ultraviolet regular, regularization? Okay, and in this setting, one sees where the euler Lagrange, so the, it, the measure is critical if and only if the bosonic field, say the gravitational field, satisfies certain equations. And these equations are then precisely the Einstein equations. So this is how general relativity comes up. And let me explain a bit more in detail what does it mean relativity comes up. So in this limiting case, space time goes over to a classical Lorentzian manifold, classical space-time. The Euler-Lagrange equations of the causal action principle give rise to the usual Einstein equations. So with an undetermined 
value of the cosmological constant. And there are here higher order correction terms in the Riemann tensor, which we haven't determined yet. So this means there's an error term, second order in the Riemann tensor, and which involves a prefactor, which scales like the Planck length to the fourth power. So this is, this is an extremely small correction term. And the gravitational coupling constant, which comes up here, this scales like the Planck length square, and the Planck length comes up here as the regularization scale, like one over this, so basically like this minimal length scale on which we regularize the system. Okay, so this is like classical GR, and I want to explain you a little bit how to go beyond classical GR. And well, uh, but that's the main point here. I mean, just getting GR back is quite nice, but of course we want to do more. We want to go ultimately to quantum gravity. Well, and if one does not perform this continuum limit, then space time no longer needs to have a manifold structure. It could be just discrete points. It could be just something non-smooth. And as a consequence, we cannot set up tensor equations anymore. And the method is to work directly with the structures of the causal fermion system and directly with the Euler Lagrange equations coming from the causal action principle. And this is a program which has been pursued to some extent. So the question is if I do not work with uh, manifolds and tensors, can I still get? the effects of gravity out of the Euler-Lagrange equations of the causal action principle. And what we did so far, or let's, or let's say a main tool here is to work with so-called surface layer intervals. I mean, usually in GR one considers surface intervals, so integrates the density of a Cauchy surface, for example. And this is quite important in order get, to get the connection on of what we experience in well, in space, so then whatever we have a time of an observer and the Cauchy surface is a T equal constant surface for an observer. And then we can see what, what's going on in our space time. It turns out that such surface integrals cannot be defined for a causal Fermi system, but instead we can introduce what we call surface layer integrals. So these are integrals which are kind of smeared out. We integrate over a strip in space time, as is shown here, and this fits together nicely with the structures of a causal Fermi system. So this means now we want to find objects of classical GR using the surface layer integrals. And one notion which has been introduced like two years ago together with Andreas Platzer, a former PhD student of mine, is the total mass of a static causal Fermi system. So since we assume that everything is static, so one has like a one parameter symmetry group describing time translations. And then one gets like a spatial measure mu here. And the idea is to compare this measure of a curved space time, say Schwarzschild, for example, to the measure describing Minkowski space. And this can be done with surface layer intervals. I mean, maybe here's just a general formula. What one does is one considers a surface layer integral, which is like a smeared out version of a integral over the surface of a big of a big sphere, similar to what one uses for the ADM mass. And then one takes the limit where the where the size of this sphere tends to infinity. And then it turns out that using this formula, one gets back the total mass if one takes, for example, Schwarzschild space time. But the point is that here no smoothness is needed. So we can define this even for discrete space times and so on. Okay, so this is one example. What we also did is we considered the connection between area change and meta flux. So suppose now this is space time. We have here omega. This is the past of a Cauchy surface. Then we have a set V, which is like the interior region of space time. Well, and then the intersection of the boundaries gives me a two dimensional surface. And then there's a way to define the area of the surface. 
Moreover, there's a way to define the metaflux through this surface. And then comparing these formulas, one sees that in the limiting case, where this two surface flows out with the speed of light, so this means in a light-like direction, and one, if one assumes also that this light-like direction is a killing direction, then one gets a simple connection between the change of the two-dimensional area and the metaflux through the surface. And this equation looks the same as a relation found by Ted Jacobson, who was interested like in, in tropic gravity. I mean, his whole motivation was quite different, but he came up with this equation using some thermodynamic considerations. And that's what we are not doing here. I mean, we give a completely different derivation of this formula, but then Ted Jacobson proceeds by showing that this equation gives back the Einstein equations up to the unknown cosmological constant. So therefore, having this formula here shows that if you go back to a classical space-time, you also get back the Einstein equations. But now this formula here holds in, much, in a much more general setting without assuming any smooth space-time structure. Okay, and finally, I wanted to mention, I think I don't, I'm running out of time, but so what? I mean, so there is also like a, the geometry of the causal Fermi system itself, which we call like a Lorentzian quantum geometry, which means that if you start from a causal Fermi system or this kind of rather abstract setting, then one can introduce spinners, one can introduce physical wave functions, and one has an object, the so-called kernel of the fermionic projector, which gives relations between nearby space-time points. And out of this kernel of the fermionic projector, one can in fact construct a spin connection. So it's like a unitary mapping from one spin space to the other. And the holonomy of this spin connection gives the curvature, notion of curvature of these quantum space-times. There's also corresponding tangent space and the corresponding metric connection. I mean, all this is, I worked this out together with Andreas Grotz about 10 years ago. And well, so this means that we have like an intrinsic uh, notions of curvature and parallel transport in such a causal Fermi system. And we also verified that in a certain limiting case, again, if when we remove the ultraviolet regularization, that we get back the uh, spin geometry, classical spin geometry. I mean, this P of X, Y goes over to a Hadamard distribution and the spin connection goes over to the spinorial levi civita connection on a spin manifold. Okay, I think, so this is my last slide. So, <clears throat> so far I, well, I briefly sketched this general setup. And I showed that in, in limiting cases, one gets uh, classical gravity back in a somewhat more general setting because we work with more general notions, no longer tied to a tensor calculus. But as I said, the ultimate goal is to describe also quantum gravity. And in fact, quantum field theory has already been worked out to some extent in what we call Minkowski type space times. And the method is to compare vacuum space time, say Minkowski space, with a general interacting space time. And this, and we were able to introduce a corresponding quantum state. And well, all this has been done just in Minkowski space just recently, but the method also applied to curved space time. So this means that the next step, we also want to move on here to curved space time to get the connection to quantum fields in curved space-time and ideally also quantum gravity. Okay, maybe there's not much enough time. Let me skip this slide. We have more details on the state. And let me thank you for, the, for your attention. As I said, you find more details on our website. If you, are more if you have become interested, then just visit us there. Okay, thank you very much for your attention. Okay, everyone, please unmute yourself and thank Felix for a very interesting talk. Unfortunately, we are 
uh, really running out of time. So I don't think we have time for questions, even though I would have actually uh, a couple of them, but uh, I just throw the ball back into Charlie's court here. Thanks, Felix, again. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you, Felix. And uh, we are happy to see that Cole Fury is here. So Cole, could you please uh, share your uh, presentation? And uh... Okay. All right. Okay. Does that look great? That's great. Yes. Okay. Uh, so we're very happy to have uh, Cole Fury talk to us about towards a full set of division algebraic representations for the standard model. Okay. So everybody can hear me okay? You can hear me okay? Yes. Perfect. Perfect. Okay. Um, so first of all, uh, thank you so much to Shadi and Michael for organizing the session for us um, and also for inviting me to come speak with you today. Um, so my talk today is based on joint work together with my collaborator, Beth Romano, who is a pure mathematician at the University of Oxford. Um, and today I would like to tell you about our current efforts uh, to obtain a full set of division algebraic representations for the standard model. Um, now, I should mention that this is a different topic than what we advertised for the conference, so I hope that uh, everybody's okay with this. Um, now, the results that we're going to, uh, that we're about to show you are very recent, um, and we hope to post them very shortly into the appendix of this preprint, um, as we're still in the process of carrying out a full analysis. So now if you've um, been keeping up with the latest developments in division algebraic model building, um, you will know that there's been a group of authors who have recently found interesting new ways to characterize the standard models gauge group. Um, so for example, there's Michel Dubois-Violette and Ivan Todorov who have studied something that's called the exceptional Jordan algebra, J3O. Um, now the exceptional Jordan algebra um, has the uh, exceptional Lie group F4 as its group of inner automorphisms. Um, and these authors were then able to describe GSM, the standard model symmetries, as the intersection um, of F4's SU3 plus SU3 and S09 subalgebras. Now, in related work uh, by Latham Boyle, uh, Latham recently showed how complexifying the exceptional Jordan algebra can upgrade S09 to S010. Um, and specifically, he started with E6 and showed that the symmetry algebra of the left right symmetric model can be uh, found to be the intersection of E6's SU3 plus SU3 plus SU3 and SO10 subalgebras. Now, finally, alternately, uh, more recently, Mia Hughes and I introduced a division algebraic model where we started with SO10 and we showed a cascade of octonionic and quaternionic complex structures, which send you from SO10 to the Patti Sala model, then down to the left right symmetric model, and then down to the standard model to, together with a B minus L symmetry. And further, we showed that requiring invariance under the complex conjugate. Um, further reduces the standard model symmetries to none other than the standard models unbroken gauge symmetries, SU3 plus U1, together with a B minus L. Um, so this was a talk that we gave on the 15th of March at Perimeter Institute. Okay. Um, so despite these new findings, uh, there are two challenges that seem to be popping up over and over again in many of our models. And so this is including um, the model that Mia and I presented as well. So the first challenge is how do we introduce chirality into our models without engineering it in? So that is the standard model has um, treats left-handed and right-handed fields differently. Um, and it can be tricky to find a mathematical structure for our theories, which automatically describe chirality in a natural way. Now, the second challenge um, is how do we introduce three generations in a natural way? So again, it's difficult to find a mathematical structure which will do this for you automatically. So to describe the situation in a nutshell, um, ultimately many authors have uh, shown that it's possible to characterize the standard models gauge group 
algebraically. So it's it's possible to characterize SU3 cross SU2 cross U1 over Z6 division algebraically. But what's more difficult is getting the representations right. Um, so it's hard to get the representations right for reasons I just mentioned, the chirality and the existence of three generations. But beyond these reasons in this talk, you might also come to appreciate um, that the problem of representations is furthermore difficult simply because of the sheer number of particles that we're trying to describe. So for my research, it's been a goal since the beginning to describe all of the standard models, degrees of freedom, both fermionic and bosonic, in terms of just a single algebra. But in order to do that, there's quite a list of irreducible representations that we need to bring on board. So under the gauge group SU3 cross SU2 cross U1 over Z6, and under local space-time symmetries, SL2C, here's what we have to describe. We've got um, left-handed up and down quarks transforming as a three, two, one, six, and a two. So the notation here means the three means that it, it transforms as a triplet under SU3. The two means that it's a doublet under SU2 left. The one six um, refers to its, uh, its weak hypercharge eigenvalue. And then the subscript two here refers to how it transforms under SL2C. Um, so I should mention here that for this talk, um, we're going to be taking all degrees of freedom to be off shell. And for the time being, um, all coefficients are going to be complex unless otherwise stated. Okay, so beyond the up and down, the left-handed up and down quarks, um, there's of course also left-handed charm and strange quarks, which transform in the same way. There's left-handed top and bottom quarks, which also transform in the same way. And then for the leptons, we've got left-handed electron and electron neutrino, which transform as a one, two, minus one half and a two. And the same goes for the muon version and the tau version. So those are all the left-handed fermions. Then for the uh, right-handed fermions, we've got a right-handed up quark, which transforms as, as a three, one, two thirds and a two. Same goes for the right-handed charm, the right-handed top. Then beyond this, we've got a right-handed down quark, which transforms as a three, one, minus one third. Same goes for right-handed strange, right-handed bottom. Um, next, we've got right-handed charge leptons. So like the electron uh, transforms as a one, one, minus one, and a two. And then we've got two more copies of those uh, given by the right-handed muon and the right-handed tau. So this is the set of fermions, fermionic representations that we need uh, to be able to describe for the standard model. But beyond this, we'd also like to describe the standard model's gauge bosons. So for this, we've got uh, gluons living in the eight of SU3. So this is 8104. And then for the uh, for SU2 left gauge bosons, uh, they transform as the 1304. And then for the U1 hypercharger is a gauge boson corresponding to 1104. And then finally, if you'd like, you can add in the Higgs, which transforms as the 1, 2, minus 1 half and 1. So, as you can imagine, finding an algebra which is the right size for all of these representations is quite a trick. I mean, it's especially difficult when you need each and every one of these of the 118 on-shell degrees of freedom to transform precisely in the right way. Um, so, you know, there's so basically the point is that there's all of these different representations that we're trying to model um, and everything needs to transform in exactly the right way. And so it's quite difficult to find a mathematical object which will describe those representations in it um, naturally. Um, so I should point out for the uh, throughout this talk, we're going to be considering off shell degrees of freedom, which then also roughly doubles the number of degrees of freedom that, that we're considering. So the point of this talk is to let you know about some preliminary, preliminary results that we recently found. So in this work, uh, we begin with the 32 complex dimensional algebra RCHO. This is otherwise known as the Dixon algebra. So RCHO is the tensor product over R of the real numbers R, the complex numbers C, the quaternions H, and the octonions O. Um, now, given that these are the tensor products um, over the reals, the real factor here in the beginning is trivial. So you can always uh, rewrite this as C cross H cross O. So this C cross H cross O is just a 32, it's a little 32 complex dimensional algebra. It's not that big. Um, nonetheless, this is going to be our only ingredient. 
Now we can build up a larger algebra from CHO by having CHO left multiply itself. That is left multiplication of this algebra onto itself gives a new algebra of linear operators on CHO. So this is commonly known as CHO's left multiplication algebra, or we can write it down as LCHO. Um, so it's this left multiplication algebra, which we're going to use to describe the standard model's degrees of freedom. So you can think of CHO's left multiplication algebra as a space of complex linear operators on RCHO. Um, furthermore, you can show that it's isomorphic to the complex Clifford algebra CL8. Or in the simplest possible terms, you can think of it as being equivalent to the 16 by 16 complex matrices, except for the fact um, that we have extra structure due to the quaternionic, the quaternions and the octonions that generate it. Um, so to, incidentally, we're going to exploit uh, this quaternionic and octonionic structure to tease out some of the properties that we see in the standard model. Now, before moving on, I'd like to mention that there's, there are two pairs of authors who have also been interested in CL8 and the standard model, namely uh, Gillard and Gresnick and Gording and Schmidt May, and their papers can be found here. Okay, so first to set up some notation. Um, now we're going to describe complex numbers like this. So um, that is the complex imaginary unit is written in the usual way. This is just using the letter I. Now quaternions are gonna be written like this where the quaternionic imaginary units are given by epsilon one, epsilon two and epsilon three. So the point is every time you see epsilon one, epsilon two, epsilon three, you need to know that we're talking about quaternions. And then next a generic octonion can be written like this. Um, where the octonionic imaginary units are given by E1 to E7. Um, so every time you see E1 to E7, you need to know that those are octonions. Okay. So our construction is going to depend on a couple of idempotents, which we're going to call little s and big S. Uh, so little s is defined like this, where Le7 means left multiplication by the octonionic imaginary unit E7. And the other idempotent, which is given by big S, um, this is constructed using the left multiplication operator that you get from multiplying the octonionic element E7 from the right. Um, so these two projection operators come up over and over again in our octonionic work. So these, these idempotents, little s and big S, are going to fill a couple of roles for us. Um, first of all, they're going to partition our CL8 algebra or our multiplication algebra into blocks. Um, and it's in these blocks that we're going to find our different, the different irreducible representations that we need. Um, and secondly, these idempotents um, can act to break the octonionic automorphism group, G2, down to SU3. So it's in fact um, this SU3, which is going to give us the color symmetry of the standard model. Okay, so now we're ready to begin. So we're gonna start with our 256 dimensional left multiplication algebra, which you might alternately think of as CL8 or even the 16 by 16 complex matrices. So in our first step, we will partition our CHO's left multiplication algebra into blocks. And we're going to do this by multiplying our algebra by little s and big S in every possible combination. And here's what that looks like. Um, now, next, we would like to identify some relevant symmetry generators. Um, so our first set of symmetry generators um, will provide us with SU3 color symmetry. And here's what they look like. So as you can see, this is a fairly simple form. Um, there are eight SU3 generators here. So J runs from one to eight. And the RJs here, those are real coefficients. Um, but most important, it's most important to note that the lambdas here um, are purely octonionic. Um, in fact, these are precisely the lambdas which generate the automorphisms of the octonions, which hold little s and big S fixed. Okay, so the point is that um, in this model, SU3 comes from the octonions, 
It comes from um, a, a subalgebra of the octonions um, G2 algebra, which is what effectively gives the automorphisms of the octonions. Okay. All right, so that's SU3. Um, now we can define a symmetry um, operator, which will give us SU2 left. And here's what that looks like. Um, so specifically, you'll recall that um, epsilon one, two, and three are quaternionic. So you'll see that this SU2 left is quaternionic. Um, and now we can finally describe um, the U1 generator, which uh, corresponds to weak hypercharge. Um, and as you may or may not know, weak hypercharge can always be written like this, where uh, weak hypercharge is given by one half B minus L plus the third uh, generator of SU2 right. Um, now, uh, it's lucky for us that uh, the, this baryon number, lepton number, and SU2 right have very simple um, expressions in this formalism. So here's what they look like. So the first one here is the B, uh, baryon number generator. The second one is lepton number generator. And the third one is what SU2 right looks like. So they're all very simple. And you'll even notice that SU2 right here is again quaternionic. It's built out of epsilon one, two, and three. Okay. All right. So we've now constructed SU3, SU2, and U1 generators. And each one of these, um, each one of these algebras commutes with the other. So now what we would like to do is we would like to take the symmetry generators and we would like to apply them to our CL8 algebra. And we're going to see how this C our CL8 algebra breaks down into irreducible representations. So here's what we get. So clearly the red irreducible representations here correspond to how they transform under SU3. The blue corresponds to how they transform under SU2 left. And the orange corresponds to how they transform under hypercharge or like what their, um, their eigenvalues are under weak hypercharge. And then finally the subscript, the black subscript on the right hand side corresponds to how these things transform under SL2C. Um, Okay, so now you might want to know, well, how much, how, how much of this um, corresponds to the standard model states that, that we are interested in? So how much of the standard model states were we, were we able to tease out in this? And we wanna know how much of this matches the standard model. So let's go back to our original list. So here on the left-hand side is the list of standard model particles that we would like to match to. Um, so these are the representations that we want on the left-hand side. And on the right-hand side is the array of irreducible representations that we found in CL8 using our symmetry operators that we introduced. So now we want to see how much, of, um, how much overlap there is between these two lists. So we can start um, with left-handed quarks for all three generations. So that's up, down, charm, strange, top, and bottom. And we find those representations living in a single block in our Clifford algebra. So that's the, the, um, the block on the top right here. The second block, which is on um, the bottom half, the, the bottom uh, blue block is um, simply a redundant antiparticle set. Okay, so those are the left-handed quarks. Next, we are gonna be interested in looking for left-handed leptons for all three generations. And we find them here. Next, we look for right-handed up and down quarks. Um, and we find those here, charm and strange, top and bottom. Okay, so, so far so good. But now we're going to look for three generations of charged right-handed leptons. However, the bad news um, is that we only find one copy. So we want three copies, we want three generations, but we only find one copy of right-handed charged leptons. Um, but on the plus side, we do find that this, uh, this right-handed charged lepton is partnered with one right-handed neutrino. So as a bonus, we got a, we got a right-handed neutrino. Okay, so now we'd like to move on to gauge bosons. Um, and we find uh, a copy which matches what we would expect for gluons. 
Um, so you should note here that in the case of gluons, they only count for one of the eight block of the blocks of eight because uh, the degrees of freedom are real here. Um, now at this point, we might be at the end of the line in that the rest of our representations um, seem to stop matching what we have in the standard model. And the main problem seems to be that the electroweak sector, I mean, it, it, the main problem seems to be this electroweak sector, um, in addition to the pair of missing uh, charged leptons that we, that we mentioned. However, um, I would like to end now by pointing out that there is a sliver of hope. Um, that is, it's hard not to notice that missing, that the missing electroweak bosons and the leptons fit. They do fit inside of this eight plus one, uh, this extra eight plus one block that we have. Um, and in fact, this is a well-known pattern that we see that shows up all of the time in symmetry breaking models, which you might actually already be familiar with. Um, that is how a U2 symmetry embeds inside of a U3 symmetry. Um, so we hope to post further details um, on this topic in the not too distant future. And that's everything I have to say. Okay, thanks. Thanks very much, Cole. Let's uh, thank Cole for the presentation. Uh, Unfortunately, we, we do not have uh, time for questions. So I, I ask you to uh, perhaps direct your questions to Cole uh, uh, through the chat, if you'd like, because we need to move on to the next uh, speaker. And it's uh, off to you, Michael. Okay, Ebru, are you ready? Um, yeah, I can share later <laughs> my screen. Stop sharing. There we go. Okay, very good. All right, so it's a great pleasure to introduce our next speaker, who is Ebru Toprak, and uh, who is going to present. Uh, Again, joint work with Shadi and myself, and it's the essential server joiners of Dirac operators under the influence of general relativistic gravity. Please, Evo. Um, thank you, Michael, for introducing uh, uh, my talk, and also thank you for inviting me to this session. It's really nice to hear all this talk over here. So um, I'm going to pass this first example because when I was practicing my talk yesterday, I realized that I don't need, I don't have time for that. So I directly start with the, with the drag operator. So uh, when we uh, define a Hamiltonian uh, for, a, for a physical reasoning, in general, we want it to be, to be sapphire joint so that we can define the unitary operator and then we can talk about the evolution of that operator. But uh, unfortunately, not every operator comes sapphire joint. And in that case, what we do is, we want to find a sapphire joint extension of that operator. And, and sometimes this extension comes unique and sometimes we have multiple extension. If it's unique, that's good because we still can talk about the evolution, but if there are more than ones, then we want to just pick one of them, um, distinguish one of them physically and make sure that our evolution actually makes sense. So if you and then this topic has been actually studied for Dirac operator uh, for a long time. And then the result is, so if we have this free Dirac operator, uh, like over here, I'm sorry. <laughs> so if we have this free Dirac operator, then we know that it is essential sapphire joint for one-time differentiable functions. And, uh, and if you want to consider the, uh, the 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 Dirac operator for the for the electron. So if we want to include the electric interaction and the Newtonian gravity interaction with nucleus, then the result is uh, over here. So we have the essential sapphire jointness if q square is uh, q square minus gm square is less than three fourth. And uh, if we go further three fourth, then we can only distinguish one of the multiple sapphire joint extensions up to one. 
And once we pass one, then we cannot even talk about any distinguished uh, sapphire joint extension. And I also just put the uh, spectrum over here, but this is not surprising. This is the regular spectrum that we know. Uh, once my uh, my potential actually goes to zero at infinity, so we have the gap between negative m and m, and we expect some point spectrum between. So looking at these two, um, two the first two uh, sapphire joints result. In fact, we can say that if we consider the 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 hydrogen atom, uh, we can we can conclude that this adding this Newtonian gravity is somehow regularized. I mean, it's a minimum minimal regularization maybe, but it regularized our, uh, our uh, drag operator. So it just extends at least the domain for Q a little bit. So the next question, and then this is the main question that we want to answer is what happens if we consider Einstein's gravity rather than Newtonian gravity? Well, Einstein's gravity doesn't really couple like this, of course, it's not that simple. First of all, we have to talk about the Einstein's equation. So what we do is we consider Einstein's Maxwell system. And um, in fact, we know by Shadi's uh, 2010 paper, this, uh, this system accepts this following uh, spherical symmetric solution. And we wanna focus on this type of solution. So here my F squared, which is my matrix depends on my mass function. And my mass function depends on my field energy function. And of course, the field energy depends on the, the electrostatic charge. So actually, there are there are well known uh, well known space times that that exactly fits in this description. So one of them is Minkowski, of course. If we take G, uh, the gravity is zero, and if we take uh, this uh, the field energy is zero, then we just directly obtain the Schwarzschild. And if we take this by R as Q over R, then we actually obtain this Resner Weil Nordstrom. And I'm gonna talk about this a little bit more. So here is what happens when we take our phi R as Q over R and then calculate all these F square R. What we obtain is this very well known RWN matrix. So now we wanna talk about this um, hydrogen atom under this uh, space time. But of course, we have to divide our problem into two parts. One of them is black hole, in other words, when I have zeros, and the other one is the naked singularity part, so when I don't have any zeros. If I have time, I will talk about this later, but first I'm gonna focus on this naked singularity. So the question is, what happens if I consider naked singularity RWN for hydrogen gas? So the direct operator, if we have a spherically symmetric matrix, then, matrix, then uh, we actually can, can write the direct operator as a direct sum of this HK. I mean, this is not really important for our result, um, but I just wanted to make sure. And this is what we have from Cohen and Powers. They say that um, direct operator has multiple sapphire joint expansion. Well, this is not a good news. And uh, this spectrum is just as we expect, actually. It's, uh, it's a good one. So it's the similar one, the other. And um, so then, the, as I said, the bad news is, well, the drug operator has multiple sapphire joint extension, and we don't really know which one is really physically distinguished. So the, then we say that, OK, uh, what could be the problem? I mean, I don't want to say a problem, but what could go wrong? What, do, what, is, what could be the thing that uh, actually prohibits us to find the sapphire, like essential sapphire joy? And we just figure out, like if we can just see easily, uh, well, actually the electric potential is too singular around zero for the, uh, for the, for the RWN. Meaning that having this uh, over here, having this phi, and taking R zero, the total uh, total uh, electric uh, electrostatic charge becomes actually infinite. Well, on the other hand, when I take my mass function over here, R as infinity, then we have a finite mass, finite ADM mass. Well, knowing that the energy and the, the mass, they have to kind of proportional, they need to be proportional to each other, 
But actually, we say that this can be the problem, maybe. This is the contradiction that we're looking for. So therefore, what we do is, OK, we say, why not we consider members of the like the members of those line elements that Shadi uh, described, uh, but we ex we uh, we just look for uh, some milder singularity around zero. Then can we actually really like uh, save the sapphire joints at the end of the day? So and this is our um, our fix. So we assume we have some assumptions on the mass function, and then we have some assumption on the charge function. Uh, so on the electrostatic charge function, this is what we assume. So of course we assume the singularity is milder around zero. So so that was our main point to discover, and at infinity we expect it to work to to look like exactly like our WN case. And for the mass function, well, the first assumption is for having a negative bare mass, like in the RWN case. And as you as you can see here, this was my uh, this was my uh, MR, and as R goes to zero, actually we have negative infinity over here as well. And the second one tells us, okay, so we have finite uh, total mass, ADM mass, and the third one tells us we are still in the naked singularity because, as I said, we don't really want to go in the in the black hole for now. And this is our result. Well. H still has multiple sapphire joint extensions. So, and, and all these expansions are coming like a restriction of our H star, the, the, the adjoint operator to this D delta, where D delta is defined as those functions uh, such that the component X zero has to have the same. Uh, so the, the division has to have a constant value. And each expansion also has the expected spectrum. So then we, we say, OK, so is there any way to, to actually save the satellite going? So OK, so we couldn't do that, but can we do something? And here are our um, also observations. So first of all, if I take beta big enough, then we might actually give some essential satellite joints. However, this does not really match with the mass function for the electrostatic space time that uh, like we considered from Shadi's paper. So this, this, they don't really match with that. And the second thing is, okay, so we can add an anom anomalous potential and then we can actually save the, save the satellite joint. So um, here's what we do. So we have this HKs, as I said, the partial wave drag operators, and then we add this anomalous part. And here's what we find. We find that if beta is um, greater than, strictly greater than alpha plus one over two, then actually we can say the essential sapphire joint. So in fact, we always thought that maybe the milder singularity can actually save us at the, day, at the end of the day, but in fact, it is the, it's kind of opposite for having the essential sapphire jointness. And if beta is equal to alpha plus one, then we also have to have some, uh, some construct, uh, some, some constraint on the uh, mu value. And um, uh, that's because beta is equal to alpha plus one over two is the, uh, the, uh, the, the strict point. And um, so I have two more time, two more minutes. So. So here is also our another, another conclusion. So with having this beta and alpha, uh, alpha restriction, um, we can easily say that like uh, if you consider drag operator in the Hoffman space time, then unfortunately, even though we add anomalous magnetic moment, we can not really say the essential sapphire joints. And that's because uh, my beta is, uh, Basically, it's, it's even negative instead of being negative. Um, so I have two more minutes. So in that case, I can also talk about the black hole case. So uh, in the black hole case, uh, so the well-known result was that you, so, so, so in the black hole case, we have uh, also two cases. So we have two, two roots here. This is what we know. Basically, we have roots, we have zeros. 
And either these values of zeros are same, but which we call sub-extremal case or not same, then we call sub-extremal case. And then if those, those roots are the same, then we call extremal case. And what we know about uh, the sapphire joints of the drag operator was given by, uh, by, uh, by again, Cohen and Powers. And this was the result. So if I basically draw the max function respect to R, then what we have is a graph like this. So this at the end, it goes like flat. So here is my R minus, and then here is my R plus. And the result of Cohen powers was this. So they studied it, this outside of the event horizon, and then they found out the drug operator is actually sapphire joint over here and with the usual uh, spectrum. Then we also studied the, um, the drug operator inside of the black hole. And our result is again, because actually we don't have this flat part, it, the direct operator, the sapphire joint of the direct operator also changes. So we figured out that over here, again, the, the direct operator is not actually sapphire joint. So again, it has uh, multiple sapphire joint expansions, which comes similar to what we described before. Um, I think I'm going to stop over here. <laughs> thank you. Okay, please unmute yourself and let's thank Ebo for the presentation. Okay, so we have a couple of minutes for questions and answers. <laughs> In fact, I would have a brief comment. At uh, some point, you said we add an anomalous uh, potential. What you meant, you add an operator for the anomalous magnetic moment, right? And uh, so uh -huh. you, uh, you said that later, no, but uh, that's what it is. And uh, so, the, yeah. and you also say, oh, we have essential salvage joiners if beta is bigger than that, and uh, et cetera, or if mu a is bigger than a constant. If one puts in empirical values, for the electron, oh. then one is way on the safe side, no? so that you didn't mention. So that yeah. means the mathematical curiosity that there is a critical value, but the physical value is, is not anywhere near that critical value. Yeah. Uh, I have a quick question. So for this anomalous magnetic moment term, um, I sort of understand why why we introduce or why you multiply it by phi prime, um, but why also multiply it by f? Um, I mean that actually comes from the uh, so we have this drag operator, and then when we actually go to the uh, to the coordinate system, we have this comes naturally. It just because. See in HK also, uh, we also have lots of FR there that just that comes just from the uh, from the transformation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean you are right. So in general, we have a like only mu, mu a times, but this this derivative, but f also comes naturally because of the transformation. Okay. Okay. I think you can, for example, think about it in terms of. You have to define a Hilbert space. And that means that you need to define an inner product as a natural inner product on that Hilbert space. I so see. that 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 would involve uh, the uh, some kind of a measure on the space like slices. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, our, our inner yeah. product actually comes something like F square R then phi, let's say C something like that so, so, we have so it's this weighted extra matrix. yeah it's kind of weighted yeah it's yeah. weighted like this and so and so like maybe at like infinity or something this is what you would see as as a, as a as a magnetic moment okay okay i think i think i sort of see thank you okay so we are ready to move on so let's thank uh, Ebro again thank you and I throw the ball back into Shadi's court.
Thank you, Michael. Our marathon continues, and uh, and uh, Dimitri, will you please share your? Uh... It's a relay, not a marathon. It's a relay. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. That's a relay. Um, so it's a great pleasure to have uh, Dimitri Kazaras uh, talking to tell us about the space-time harmonic functions and the mass of three-dimensional asymptotically flat initial data for Einstein's equations. That was a very long title. <laughs> well, thank you very much for saying the very long title. Uh, and thank you for all the organization and the invitation. Very happy to be here. Uh, okay, so what I wanna talk about today uh, is joint work with the number of people who have been interested in the circle of ideas, including Hugh Bray, Sven Hirsch, Marcus Curie, Daniel Stern and he used Zhang. Uh, okay. So just the can, you, can you make that full screen? Uh, or is it already full screen on your side? It is somewhat full screen. Uh, let's see. Uh, I think I can make it actually full screen. Is that? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> okay. So here's the setting. We have some spatial hypersurface of the Lorenzian four manifold. Uh, M and this gets a Ramanian metric in a second fundamental form, K. Uh, and then we kind of throw away the Lorentzian manifold for the time being, and we just study this triple of data. Three-dimensional manifold, Ramanian metric, and a symmetric two tensor, which represents second fundamental form, called an initial data step. Okay, and you can use the gauss guadagni equations to relate the curvature of the four-dimensional space-time to the three-dimensional uh, guy. And you can write the energy and momentum densities just in terms of the geometry of MGK, like so. Uh, good, here I use R for scalar curvature. <clears throat> All right, so uh, mainly I'll talk about today uh, asymptotically flat initial data. So outside of some compact set or perhaps non-compact set containing several ends, uh, there's a diffeomorphism from the complement of the set to uh, R3 minus a ball in which, uh, you know, in these coordinates, the metric in the second fundamental form decay to respectively the flat metric or a zero uh, with some order of decay called tau, which, is bigger than a half. Okay, and the dominant energy condition becomes mu is greater than or equal to the norm of J. So that's what we're studying. Asymptotically flat, three-dimensional initial data sets with this condition. Okay, if the local energy and momentum are inevitable, they're in L1, uh, then these global quantities are well-defined. Asymptotic quantities. But for each end, you get a notion of total energy and the uh, components of total linear momentum you know, in the ADM formalism. Okay. Very good. Okay. So uh, I, let's consider the time symmetric situation where the K tensor is zero. And now you're just looking at Ramanian manifolds with uh, uh, scalar curvature greater than or equal to zero. Okay, so here's the idea. So I want uh, here's the let me give you this version first, and then we can talk about the more general situation where you have a non-trivial k. Okay, so let's fix uh, in the asymptotically flat coordinates. Let's fix a linear function. For instance, it could just be like uh, x one. Uh, it should be linear and you know have length one. Okay, here is the basic formula or inequality. Uh, this version was with uh, Gray, Curie, and Stern uh, almost two years ago. Okay, so uh, there is a canonically defined harmonic function, which I'll consider on the region exterior to all minimal surfaces. I uh, call that Mx. That's a well-defined, uh, also asymptotically flat manifold, locally isometric to the original. Anyways, on this on this exterior region, uh, there is a canonical harmonic function, which is asymptotic to L, the linear function you fix at infinity. Uh, and for that function, the following holds: The total mass, which is just energy in this 
times the metric case is almost equal to, uh, morally, you should think of this as inequality, but it's greater than or equal to uh, this quantity. Uh, particularly, you see the Hessian of that function squared divided by the uh, length of the gradient, and then plus the length of the gradient times the scalar curvature of the manifold. Okay, this is very nice. Uh, so if the scalar curvature is not negative, definitely the mass is non negative. Moreover, if the mass vanishes, uh, then you see, okay, since the right hand side is not negative, each of the, these two things are greater than or equal to zero, they both have to vanish. So that tells you basically that the, the Hessian of your function has to vanish in this case of equality when the mass is zero, uh, which gives you a parallel one form or vector field, which splits your manifold geometrically as a product and the asymptotically flat condition then makes you totally flat. So positivity is nice to see and the rigidity is also right here in this formula. Uh, some remarks. Uh, we only recently found out that uh, some of these ideas were pursued by uh, Jasierski in the late 80s uh, using harmonic functions or at times P harmonic functions. There's some interesting work here. Uh, not exactly the same formula, but the ideas were definitely there. Uh, okay, but in terms of the formula that we see here, this uh, estimate does not require that the scalar curvature is positive or non-negative. Uh, you can find the function, you can write down this formula in general. That's kind of an advantage over uh, you know, some previous uh, positive mass theorems like uh, Chain and Yao and Witten. Uh, Chain and Yao is a proof by contradiction, so you don't exactly get a formula for mass. And Witten considers a certain spinner, which at least formally speaking only exists. But you, you can only really find it, or <laughs> maybe you can find it in more general, but his style of argument only finds it when you have a curvature condition, scalar non negative. So this has the appeal of this, form, this formula that I'm displaying here has the appeal of, it's almost a formula for mass in general. And so you can see directly how it interacts with scalar curvature. And you know, when it's not negative, the mass has to be non negative. Uh, you still might be a little bit skeptical of this result, why I'm so excited about it. I, this is like the sixth proof of the positive mass theorem in this context. Um, but there's still some ideas here that we would like to understand better. In particular, one often wants to understand the, when you're, when you're interested in the scalar non-negative condition, there are these two main tools, spinners and minimal surfaces. You would like to see how they interact better. Um, so the more proofs, then you see the more ways, you see a little bit more about that relationship. In particular here, uh, this positive mass theorem, it's in between the two ideas uh, in the sense that the minimal surfaces used in Shane and Yao in a rigorous way correspond to the whole foliation that you get by the harmonic function. Sigma T here is the level set, the pre-image of T uh, by U. And that whole foliation of surfaces uh, in a sense, contains the same information as a minimal surface. Uh, and there's also comparisons with the uh, Witten proof where you would uh, compare the asymptotically constant harmonic spinner uh, with the differential of this harmonic function. Okay, but let me tell you the, the rough idea because uh, there's some other things I want to tell you about uh, what I find interesting about this formula and related formulas. Uh, but let me tell you briefly the idea. So the thing that got this started was um, a manuscript by Daniel Stern, postdoc at uh, Chicago. Uh, he did the following. Okay, given a harmonic function or harmonic map to a circle, something like that, I uh, compute the Laplacian of the norm of this, uh, the norm of the gradient of this function or the differential of this, uh, you know, map to S1. Uh, okay, if there was a squared here, if I was looking at the Laplacian of the norm gradient squared, then there's a Bachner formula that says this is this Laplacian thing is equal to 
And remember the Hessian plus the Ricci curvature and the gradient uh, of, in the direction of the gradient of U. Uh, but if you do this with a slightly different power, but namely one instead of two, uh, something interesting happens. So you can think of, let's see, I can annotate briefly here, but so in the Bachner formula, this is a very rough sketch here, but <laughs> uh, you, you have this, uh, the Ricci curvature uh, in the direction of the gradient of U. So you can interpret the gradient of U as a uh, normal field to a level set, sigma T. Okay, so now this Ricci curvature term in the Bachner formula is uh, the Ricci curvature in a direction normal to a surface. And now you can use the uh, gauss godazzi equations to break up the curvature of the three-dimensional manifold in terms of these surfaces. Uh, the idea now is you have chosen the right power of the gradient of U so that when you do this, uh, the Gauss curvature of the level set appears in such a way that you can use gauss Bonnet. Okay. In particular, what he, what he showed in, was there a question? Okay. Uh, so, oh, let me go back one. For instance, for a three-dimensional closed Riemannian manifold, uh, he showed this very provocative formula. If you integrate the Euler characteristic of the level sets, use gauss bonnet on the Gauss curvature term in, when you do what I suggest, uh, that is bounded by a similar thing to what I showed before, Hessian of the function plus scalar curvature. In particular, uh, if you have positive scalar curvature, that tells you this average Euler characteristic is positive. So at least one of the level sets or a component of one of the level sets has to be a sphere. And so for instance, you can immediately tell that uh, a three torus cannot have positive scalar curvature from this formula because components of level sets of our harmonic function have to be homologically non-trivial and the torus doesn't have any homologically non-trivial spheres. Anyways, it's a very interesting, it could have been written down you know, 50 years ago, but uh, it, it wasn't. Anyway, so we, uh, if you take these ideas to asymptotically flat manifold, uh, you'll incur boundary terms in more than one way. A boundary term from integrating the Laplacian and a boundary term from using gauss uh, Bonnet, because now you have the geodesic curvature of the boundary of these, these level sets. It turns out when you do this, you get these two terms that I just described. Um, Here's a schematic picture down here, by the way, you have these different colored sheets. Those are level sets of your harmonic function. Uh, they could have different shapes. Uh, and here, this gray object is like the boundary of the ambient manifold perhaps. Uh, anyway, so each of these things converges to mass, uh, different parts of it, and roughly ratios of one to two. Each of these two terms uh, converges to the mass, or in this case, just energy of the, uh, Asymptotically flat manifold. Okay, so it's a, I, I like that idea. Uh, now let's take it into a space time setting where we have a non trivial K. Uh, for this, we have to get K involved in the equation uh, for the function. So we define this kind of what we call as the null space time Hessian. It's kind of a kind of a space time, it's like a Hessian using the space-time metric, but only from information on the manifold M. Okay, it's uh, like the usual Hessian of a function on a three manifold, but then plus the symmetric two tensor K scaled by the norm of uh, the gradient of U. Another interpretation, you could you think of the differential of U, that's a one form on the three manifold, and then you promote it to a null one form on the manifold, but you know, with values in the <laughs> cotangent bundle of the Lorentzian manifold, just by adding an appropriate multiple of the, the, the DT uh, or, or the normal to your uh, three manifold. And you take the tangential part. That's an interpretation of the space time hash. Okay, and you take the trace and you get this kind of. Uh, equation, uh, Laplace of u plus trace k times norm gradient of u is equal to zero. It's kind of the analog of 
harmonic, uh, which incorporates the K tensor. The model is, say, uh, the function z plus t in Minkowski space, or, you know, z is not a four, it could be x or y. Um, it's kind of a functions with a null gradient. And uh, this is what you see in the, the rigidity case. If you take z plus t and restrict it to any spatial slice in Minkowski, it will satisfy the space-time Hessian equals zero equation. OK, and you get uh, the following main theorem that I wanted to talk about the, with uh, Ben Hirsch and Marcus Curie. Uh, you get a uh, satisfying similar formula in the space-time setting. Uh, this, this is, of course, you know, this formula wasn't known before, but you know, it proves the positive mass theorem, which is also original proofs due to Shane and Yao and Witten. Uh, but you see that uh, depending on the direction that you would like uh, u to be asymptotic to, uh, you get e plus the linear momentum in that direction is bounded by uh, this very similar expression. Where here the Hessian is now replaced with space time Hessian. Now, if you just choose the asymptotics to be minus the linear momentum of the end of the manifold that you're interested in, you get. Uh, e minus norm p is uh, non-negative. And you get the rigidity. Uh, like I said, the x plus t or z plus t functions in Minkowski, they satisfy this, uh, this quantity here equals 0, space-time Hessian is 0. OK, that's the main. Uh, and you have to pass to some <laughs> generalized exterior region uh, that I, I won't mention here. OK, just a minute to wrap up. <clears throat> uh, just a comparison to spinners. So in Witten's proof, considers the kind of a similar thing, uh, kind of a spinner that kind of comes from the Lorentzian 4 manifold, uh, using a connection that comes from that, that manifold. Uh, the comparison is the spinner is, should be compared to the differential of our space-time harmonic function. In particular, you could take a direct, you know, this kind of direct harmonic spinner, you can square that into a one form. And the Dirac equation corresponds to uh, hmm? space-time Hessian or uh, space-time Laplacian equals zero equation. Uh, yes, so what's interesting here, this is the point that I wanted to get to, is that, okay, it's not so surprising there's some correspondence between, you know, a spinner and a one form and one proof of the positive mass theorem and another one. What's interesting is that our proof, it requires you, it requires not just a one form, but it requires the underlying function because you need to use gauss bonnet uh, And so that's kind of the alluring thing here that I haven't totally figured out. If anyone has some leads, please <laughs> share with me. But uh, to get our version of the positive mass theorem, you need to integrate that one form to a function and study its level set, which you don't see at all in the spinner picture. Yeah, that's, that's kind of some <laughs> provocative remark to leave you with, and, and thanks for your attention. All right, uh, let's unmute ourselves and thank uh, Dimitri for the presentation. And uh, time for a quick question uh, or comment. So, so Dimitri, I have a question. So. Uh, in this, in Bray's work on uh, zero area singularities that Annegret talked about, there's also a harmonic function there that, that shows up. That's uh, in, the, in the definition of these uh, regular zero area singularities. Have you looked into whether there is any connection with them? Um... Uh, I I mean, the answer is no, uh, but it, it's interesting. Uh, this is kind of a direction uh, of interest. Um, everything here is very much suited for harmonic functions, which are asymptotic to linear functions, in which case the analysis of the, you know, where you imagine the level sets are kind of like planes, the analysis is suited to that. Uh, one would be interested in adapting this to uh, situation where the level sets or, or the function you would imagine is more spherically symmetric, uh, like in that kind of setting. Uh, that we haven't totally 
uh, explored. Uh, there should be something there though, uh, maybe in the direction of uh, Penrose or something like that, Penrose inequality. Is there time for a quick question? Go ahead. So this function that you mentioned in the last slide, this puzzling function, it, that's not the L function, right? I, I, what, I is have, the, what is the L function? Yeah, I have a question about this L function, this linear function that you, you want to be asymptotic to. What's the role of that? Where is that usually used? Oh, oh, oh this, uh, uh, yeah, uh, that just determines the direction A. That's just short, that's just the notation for like, uh, the direction A, which appears here. You're talking about this little L function? Yeah. Uh, yeah, so that, that's just that uh, the, the equation you wanna solve is this, uh, you know, this type of equation, uh, this operator equals zero, and then the function is asymptotic to L. And when you solve that equation through this calculation, this is the formula you get. Uh, and the L determines the little A, which appears here. It's just a, it just measures a direction. So sorry okay. if I was confusing there. All right. Uh, well, let's thank Dimitri again for his presentation. And it's back to you, Michael. Thanks, Shadi. And uh, by the way, it goes on to Wu Huang. And Wu, please share your screen. Can you all hear me? I can, for sure. Can you make that full screen? I'll try. Okay, very good. So it's a great pleasure to introduce the next speaker, who is Wu Huang from the University of Texas, San Antonio, and who is going to speak to us about unreasoned developments in the theory of relativistic dissipative fluids. Please, Wu. Thank you so much, Michael, and uh, thanks to you both for inviting me. It's a great pleasure and very glad to be here. So we have such a variety of uh, topics, and uh, this is going a little bit back to uh, physics and more on the macroscopic side. And I would like to speak about uh, some joint work with my colleagues, um, uh, Marcel Disconsi from Vanderbilt, Maria from UTSA, uh, and also my physics colleagues, uh, Jorge Noronha and Fabio from various universities all over the world. And um, I'm going to talk about these two uh, recent papers of ours. By the way, can you see my cursor? Okay, very good. Um, so, um, I know that uh, Marcel Grossman is very astrophysics oriented, but I want to um, highlight another area of fundamental physics, which is heavy ion collisions. So here you see one such facility um, um, where these experiments are carried out. So essentially what you do is you accelerate um, heavy ion nuclei like gold and um, you know, lead uh, ions uh, to very high relativistic velocities and then you let them smash together and you get um, these collisions here and then you get a shower of particles. So we are not really interested in that shower of particles uh, here outside but we're really interested in what goes on in the center of this collision. And here is sort of a, um, uh, this is not a cartoon picture, this is more like a simulation. And I also have a cartoon picture on the next slide. So imagine that these are the two nuclei which are flung together at relativistic speeds. And this is from the, the lab frame of view so that uh, these two, the, these are moving very quickly along this direction. So from our point of view, they are represented as very flat disks due to uh, relativistic lens contraction. Then these come together. And what happens now is that these nuclei, after they come together, they will penetrate each other. So, uh, and in the region in between, after the collision, they create this plasma. So, uh, and in this plasma, uh, you cannot find any ordinary uh, protons or neutrons because 
the way we think about it is that this collision injects so much kinetic energy that uh, everything inside here is totally deconfined. So it's a gigantic big mess uh, made of uh, pro uh, sorry made of quarks and antiquarks. So most of the matter inside this is um, uh, is generated by the kinetic energy of that collision. And we have a lot of gluons, so this is called uh, the quark gluon plasma. And all of that happens very quickly and before this uh, shower of particles uh, can be observed. One second. So this shower of particles comes afterwards, after this uh, mixture here has cooled down and then it uh, creates uh, uh, further hadrons, which we can, then can measure. So here's a cartoon picture of this. Uh, uh, process. So this is after the collision, we expect that the remnants of the two nuclei um, fly away. And in between you have this plasma. So how do we describe uh, this uh, system? Well, um, we usually use uh, some kind of fluid description. So we think of this as being a many particle system with a large number of collisions. Uh, we have a lot of gluons, quarks and antiquarks, and it wouldn't be quite sensible to go um, to the um, most basic level of uh, microscopic description for that system, which would be um, which would be the, um, you know, uh, describing individual quarks and gluons uh, with, quantum, with uh, quantum mechanics or quantum field theory, but we want to regard this sort of a, as a mixture and we want to have this a bird's eye view of this system as a, as a macroscopic fluid. So since we have um, high flow velocities, we usually we need to take into account um, relativistic hydrodynamics. And uh, actually, there's a misprint here. Um, there's no gravity in this talk. So um, sorry about that. So what is the state of the art in this uh, field? Um, the currently accepted model is uh, to regard this plasma as a dissipative fluid. So uh, people have tried to model it as a perfect fluid, but um, the current consensus is that there are some dissipative effects involved, such as maybe diffusion, heat conduction, and also viscosity, which is sort of a, one of the main effects here. And if you want to learn a little bit more about that, also the physics literature is very uh, extensive. Um, you can look at a very nice um, uh, overview article by these uh, three authors here. So let me show you some of the equations. First, for a relativistic uh, perfect fluid. And um, for the relativistic perfect fluid, we have this energy momentum tensor where epsilon is the total energy density. We have, as usual, the four velocity. And um, we have, of course, the pressure, which is uh, given as a uh, from some equation of state. And when you work out the uh, consequence of uh, energy momentum conservation, you get these two equations here. You'll get the conservation of um, your total energy and um, there's a bracket missing here, and then you get the relativistic Euler equation. And then you try to close that system using your equation of state, which expresses your pressure as a function of your, of your energy. So, um, so how do we bring in these uh, dissipative um, uh, contributions? So we want to model something like uh, like bulk viscosity or shear viscosity or maybe heat conduction. And that has a very long history. So it started in the 1940s um, with a very famous proposal by uh, Eckhart, who was essentially the first person to write down a relativistic um, theory of a, for a dissipative fluid. Also, there's another famous proposal that came later by, um, that can be found in a book by Landau and Lifshitz. So the problem with those um, proposals is that uh, the, the equations that they propose are more of a parabolic character. 
And in relativity, we, we wouldn't like that because as you know, the um, classical heat equation has an infinite speed of propagation. So um, in the physics literature, this is referred to as the uh, causality problem. So we really want some underlying macroscopic equation which uh, respect relativity in the sense that um, you don't have that infinite speed of propagation. Also, the, uh, these proposals by Eckert and Landau Lifshitz, they suffer from other defects um, which were discussed in this paper by Hiscock and Lindblom in 1985, and which they uh, refer to as catastrophic instability. So if you do sort of a linearized analysis, you will just find that uh, these, um, um, these, the solutions become very quickly unstable when you start from uh, something that's a perturbation of a, very, of, a, of a rest state of the fluid. So how can we circumvent these problems? And um, there are many proposals in the literature, uh, but sort of the first and um, up to now, maybe the least understood mathematically proposal um, is the one by uh, Israel and Stewart. So in the physics literature, it's sort of, it goes by the name of uh, these two authors, Israel Stewart model. Uh, uh, there was an important contribution by uh, Müller, which came a little bit earlier. And here are the equations. So, um, so the equations of motions are, are modified. So the first equation is still the con conservation of energy, but you have this additional term here. And um, then you have the relativistic Euler equation, which has additional contributions. So you have this uh, what we call this capital pi, which we call the bulk viscous pressure. So that will modify your ordinary hydrostatic pressure. And then you have this, uh, the shear stresses. So whenever you um, deal with viscosity, you, you imagine that macroscopic, macroscopically you have these fluid layers rubbing on each other maybe. So there can be these forces which act transversely to the direction of motion. And that's what you, will describe using the stress tensor here. So it's very much like if you think about how do I get from the ordinary Euler equation, non-relativistic to the Navier-Stokes equation. So you just put in these, these stresses. Okay, so um, the new thing about this are the two evolution equations for the capital Pi and the, uh, and the stress tensor. So by the way, this is sort of a simplified version of the equations, um, which are very suitable for doing analysis. And there, there are many uh, different variants of this, this model, but the ideas are very, very similar. So um, let me focus on the last two equations. So you're introducing these new quantities. Uh, you're introducing these new quantities. And in this model, you have to postulate additional evolution equations uh, for those. So if you look only at this red part, say in this equation, this is sort of similar to Navier-Stokes, where you just connect the stresses with um, the kinematic shear. So sigma is a well-known quantity. Um, you can compute that from the gradients of your velocity field. And that's exactly how, this part is exactly how you uh, put in, you arrive at the Navier-Stokes equations. But the blue part, these terms are sort of um, new in this model. And they contain time derivatives of uh, pi and this uh, tensorial pi. And then you introduce two additional new parameters, tau naught and tau one. And those play the role of relaxation times. And those are just positive parameters, which may depend on your thermodynamic quantities. Uh, by the way, um, how much time do I have? When, when did I start? I'm sorry. You started 10 minutes before the hour. And okay. so you have about uh, seven minutes to finish completely. OK, but all right. No discussions. OK, so uh, I'll make it quick. Um, so these relaxation times play a crucial role in ensuring that the system uh, is hyperbolic and also that the system is causal. 
So here's just, uh, I don't have any mathematical detail, but here's just the, the toy model. And that goes back to, um, you know, uh, older work by uh, Cataneo. So suppose you want to model relativistic heat conduction, but forget about relativity, relativity for a moment. Just consider uh, the three-dimensional heat flux. And ordinarily, you would say that the heat flux is driven by the gradient of the temperature. Uh, so you have this part of uh, your heat flux, but then you add suddenly this term over here. So a relaxation time times the time derivative of Q. And then you apply the usual reasoning where you say, okay, you have energy conservation and the temperature is um, proportional to the energy content of each uh, fluid element. And after a few simple steps, you arrive at this equation. So if you, if you set this relaxation time to be zero, then you arrive just at the ordinary heat equation, which has infinite speed of propagation. But owing to this uh, additional term here, you have something that's more similar to a wave equation because you have this uh, second time derivative. Uh, and together with the second time, the second spatial derivative, it sort of dominates the qualitative behavior of that PDE, and suddenly you have a finite speed of propagation. So that's one way how you could cure that problem with the infinite speed of propagation. Okay, so uh, maybe let me emphasize that this model is uh, fairly complicated from a PDE point of view. And although you have these additional terms, you have to perform this very detailed analysis to show that it is actually hyperbolic and well posed. And here's our theorem. So uh, it simply says that the Cauchy problem for those equations, um, given initial data in a certain Gervais space, which I won't have time to explain, is locally well posed. So we have the short time existence of, uh, of these very smooth solutions. Um, and uh, moreover, the solution is is causal, uh, at least for, um, for the initial data from a certain open set um, that we can't characterize. And um, so, uh, so this is, uh, as a first result, pretty satisfying. By the way, um, the set of the admissible initial data is uh, physically reasonable, so it's not something crazy. We can describe that explicitly, and it's characterized by a set of inequalities involving uh, the energy density, the, uh, these bulk quantities, and the eigenvalues of my, initial, uh, of my initial shear stress. So note that these quantities have to be specified as part of initial data. So they, they are indeed independent fields and not like um, in the ordinary Navier-Stokes equation where you maybe just specify the velocity field. So these are really independent degrees of freedom. Okay, um, let me just mention one more result before we get to the end. So another interesting question that uh, we usually, what that we may ask is, uh, now we know that there are smooth solutions and can we show that these smooth solutions have a finite uh, lifespan? So do they break down at some, at some finite time? And uh, this is of course connected to uh, shock formation, uh, for relativistic perfect fluids for which we have a very well-developed theory. But unfortunately that theory is not, um, at, at this stage is not applicable to our, our fluids uh, because we're lacking these geometric structures. Instead, what we did is we uh, went back to a very nice result by uh, Shadi and Yan Guo from 1999 and indeed, um, taking that as a starting point, but extending that result, um, we were able to find a, uh, a singularity formation result, but only for a sort of a, a modif sort of a simplified system where we drop the, the shear stress completely. But still, we have a very general equation of state, and we make um, otherwise just this key assumption, but apart from that, these coefficients can be, uh, 
very, very general, and also the pressure can be very, very general. And the theorem just says that, let me just move, sorry about that. Oh, that was the theorem. Okay. It just says that we can construct smooth initial data um, that the local smooth solution breaks down in, in finite time. I do have a couple of details uh, from the proof, but um, I don't have time to go into that. So maybe let me watch, mention one more thing. Uh, so we start uh, similarly as in the proof by Shadi, but there's a very big problem because we have this independent equation for the bulk viscosity, which contains this gradient. And in the context of the proof, uh, this quantity is impossible to control from the PD point of view because we don't have this constructive machinery to form the shocks. So we cannot control this quantity but um, there's a way to control that. Uh, a little bit surprisingly, it introduces an auxiliary transport equation in, um, there should be an epsilon. So in, in those quantities, and we get the control from there. So it's a little bit of a roundabout way, but uh, I think mathematically quite, quite interesting. So we managed to find this sort of additional structure in the equations. Okay, so that's all I have. So thank you very much for, for listening. Okay, please everyone unmute yourself and let's give who a hand. Thank you. Yeah, thank you a lot, Wu. That was really a very nice presentation, in particular the connection between violations of, of uh, what people would call causality and how you could restore it and uh, to make sense of dissipative equations. And, Relativity, but unfortunately, we have to move on. We don't have time for a discussion session. So please, everyone, if you have questions, send them in the chat directly to Wu. And I'm throwing the ball one more time back to Shadi. Yes, thank you, Michael, and thank you, Wu. So, and uh, last but not least, we have uh, Eric Amorim. Uh, So Eric, uh, so it's a great pleasure to hear Eric tell us about the Maxwell, Bob, Landy, Thomas, Podolsky, Einstein system for a static point source. Thank you. Thank you all for being here. Thank you for the invitation. So this is a uh, work that I completed for my thesis at Rutgers with Shadi and Michael who are here uh, last year. And now I'm a postdoc at University of Cologne. So I wanna talk about, first of all, what is the, the scope of this project, where it fits in the big picture. It's something that Annegret already mentioned today earlier. So if you look at the first question here, can the Einstein equations of the general relativity alone dictate the motion of point particles when, when you think of point particles as naked singularities of the space-time? I don't have an answer to that question. The, the place where my project fits is, is much more modest into this question. But in, in related to this question, one can also mention that in special relativity, Maxwell-Maxwell electromagnetism, which are just the, the regular Maxwell equations as we will see, is actually problematic if you want to formulate the joint evolution of point sources together with the fields. Essentially because of the, they, they give you the infinite field energy of even if you have just one particle, the, the energy of the field that it generates itself is infinite. So you, you have the problems of uh, how to define the self force and so on. But for alternate alternative theories of electromagnetism, and the one that I'm going to talk is the Maxwell BLTP, Bob, Lande, Thomas, Podolsky. Uh, this can be done in some, uh, given certain restrictions, this will be my reference number five later by Michael and Shadi. And so what about GR? If you want to do this in GR, well, first of all, what does the space-time of just one point charge look like if it obeys this so-called Maxwell BLTP electromagnetism? Is the electric field energy going to be finite? Yes, it is. And how bad is the singularity? How uh, certain curvature invariants blow up, for example? So to explain, what is this BLTP business? Let me first start with Maxwell-Maxwell. 
So what I'm going to call the pre-metric Maxwell equations in, in flat space, Minkowski space, if you have sources, the charge density rho, the current density j, these two systems in the first line here, those are the pre-metric equations for fields E, B, D, H. And then uh, you have to specify the, a relationship between B and E and D and H, sorry, D and E, H and B. This is called vacuum law. So the Maxwell vacuum law is written right here, D equals E, H equals B. So whenever I say Maxwell, Maxwell, the second Maxwell here refers to the vacuum law. And in tensor form, these equations are just the usual df equals zero, which means f is dA. And then dm equals some non-homogeneous term given by some current uh, one form j. And you see the Hodge dual here, star j. And the relationship between the, the fields here, the vacuum law is given by m equals star f. All of this comes from an action principle that I'm calling s down here with a uh, d is just a uh, arbitrary domain in your space time. And the Lagrangian that you integrate is this f wedge star f. So this is all standard how to formulate Maxwell equations in a manifold. So the difference in BLTP now is that you still have the same pre-metric equations for fields E, B, D, H, but now the relationship between the fields is like this. You have a constant kappa here, which is large. So this one over kappa square will be very small. And you have the wave operator. Um, so you see that this is just a small modification of the Maxwell vacuum law. Uh, this was originally proposed in the 40s by these four people here, Bob Plande, Thomas Podolsky. And this also has a tensorial formulation. This is the, the vacuum law down here. M is not just star F, but it has some higher order terms, the two derivatives of F. And the, it also has an associated Lagrangian that you, that you see down here. So it also comes from an action. And just so for, for now, let's, for, for the remainder of this talk, we only have one particle with charge Q and it's just sitting at, at the origin of its space time. So it's static. So you don't have magnetic fields being H. Let's just talk about D and E. And E comes from a potential function phi. So I have here a little table of comparison. Uh, Maxwell Maxwell, for example, has this Coulomb potential Q over R, but Maxwell BLTP is gonna have a modification of it that that's very small for large R. So if you are away from the particle, you, you basically see the regular Maxwell equations. But if you are close to the particle, you see that this, this expression here actually makes the quantity phi of zero defined. It's finite. Let's not worry about the fields D and E, but I want you to look at the field energy. It's infinite in the case of Maxwell Maxwell, and it's finite. And it's also given in terms of phi of zero for Maxwell BLTP. And you he see here an integral that defines what is the field energy, but we don't have to worry too much about that. So now you can, you can talk about electromagnetism in GR if you have a tensorial formulation like this, but just for one particle. So consider a Lorentzian static spherically symmetric spacetime with a singularity, actually a, a one dimensional line T equals, uh, sorry, it's R equals zero corresponding to the word line of a particle of charge Q. So the um, a general spherically symmetric metric, I'm gonna write it in this way. It has the, the two unknown, fun unknown functions. The second one here uh, is the zeta function. And I'm calling the first one simply psi square over zeta. So psi is the, or psi square is the product of the two first metric coefficients. And all the talks that we've seen today, psi was equal to one. And it's not going to be the case here. But so you have these two unknown functions in your metric. And you also have a potential one form A that only has the electric potential part in it, the phi. It doesn't have any uh, magnetic potential because of the space time being static. OK, so you consider a metric of this form. You have the Einstein equations also, the gen, uh, standard Einstein equations here, where the stress tensor t mu nu if you have a theory coming from a Lagrangian, you can find it by variations of that action with respect to the metric. And assumptions that are, that are good for you to make, uh, you, use, you normally want your space time to be asymptotically Minkowski, or asymptotically flat, so you want the functions psi and zeta to go to one for large r. And in terms of uh, the electromagnetism, you want your space time to, to look like 
the the regular Maxwell, the, the, the space time that comes from Maxwell Maxwell, uh, if you are away from the singularity. So the, the phi potential, normally you want it to be zero at our infinity, but more importantly, I have a, a variable that I'm going to consider in place of phi prime, which is I'm calling W here, you see it down here. Uh, you want it to go to zero. If you think about what that means in this definition of W here, if W is zero for large R, remembering that psi for large R is one, so it's saying essentially that phi prime is minus Q over R square, which is the Coulomb potential. So when W goes to zero, you, you're recovering the Maxwell Maxwell electromagnetism. Okay, so my goal for this project is to study that space time. Let me go back. Uh, when the Lagrangian is for the Maxwell BLTP theory, so study if it has a solution with finite energy. But I just want to mention, this was mentioned here today many times, the, the riser Nordstrom, riser vial Nordstrom space-time is the one that comes from the L corresponding to Maxwell Maxwell, so usual electromagnetism. The solution, it just looks like this. Psi is constant equal to one. W is constant equal to zero. And, and the second metric coefficient is, is this. It has a parameter M that's the ADM mass of the space-time other than also having the G, the Q in it. When, for a certain choice of these parameters, which is true, for example, if you're modeling a subatomic particle like an electron, the coordinate system is global, so there will be no horizons. It's a naked singularity. But as I mentioned before, even in this general relativistic case, the field energy is gonna be infinite. And also, something that you can use to, to measure how strong the singularity is. This is called the Kretschmann scalar of the, the curvature, a curvature uh, invariant. It blows up as R to the minus eight when R, R goes to zero, which is a pretty severe blow up. So you cannot do anything reasonable with this if you want to formulate a problem with, with more particles, the joint evolution of these particles in, in general relativity. Um, but now I can probably skip most of this. Anagret mentioned a lot of this work number six by Shadi. Uh, this was a study of alternative theorems of electromagnetism, which unfortunately does not include the, the ones coming from BLTP, vacuum law. And in this study, it, all, all those space times had the psi function equal to one. This the product between the two metric, first metric coefficients was one, and this is not gonna be the case for us, but I think what's important to mention here is the mass function. Anytime you have a spherical symmetric space-time like this, you can define this mu mass function by using the, the second metric coefficient. It, it just, this is the, the formulation of how it's defined. And the value of mu as r goes to infinity is the ADM mass. And it's also very reasonable to call the value of mu as r goes to zero, the bare mass. And in this work uh, of Shadi, you actually have this relationship between the electromagnetic field energy and the ADM mass and the bare mass, which makes a lot of sense if you think about it. It's saying that the total energy content of the space-time comes from the bare mass, the, the mass at the, at the location of the particle, plus the energy of the field. And also you have to have non-positive bare mass, otherwise there would be a horizon in your space-time. You, you would not be modeling a, a particle as a naked singularity. And for, for these space-times, the Kretschmann scalar blows up, but more mildly, r to the minus four. Uh, let me skip this one. And let, let me tell you now what, what happens if you try to study the BLTP, uh, if you try to couple Maxwell BLTP to the Einstein equations. So you get this system for the three unknowns of our problem. Remembering that W is essentially phi prime with some other uh, functions multiplying it. And where here you see an epsilon, I, I'm taking the constant C, the charge, and also the kappa from BLTP all equal to one. And when I do that, essentially the, the Newton's gravitational constant G gets replaced by this number epsilon. That's a very small number doesn't matter that this kappa is supposed to be very large. I'm taking essentially, even if you take one over kappa to be the Planck length, this is still gonna be a very small number, this epsilon. So you, you're almost forced to think of the system as a 
you study it as the perturbation of the epsilon equals zero case. Um, I wanted to see here that the, the psi function, psi prime is strictly negative. So it's not gonna be constant equal to one. However, it does not show up in the other equations. So that makes it easier to study. You can essentially try to solve the two, the equations for zeta and w first and then find psi. Uh, okay. So for epsilon equals zero, we have the flat space solution, which is once again, just Maxwell BLTP in Minkowski space. It's given by these expressions right here. Uh, and I'm putting an index zero on top of the functions. And the electric field energy, if you write down what it is in this, in general relativity um, for a theory coming from, from a Lagrangian, you can do that. Uh, you can see that the finiteness of this integral away from zero is, is all, almost automatic from the asymptotic conditions that you'd like to assume of your solution. But the finiteness close to zero is where you have some problems. It is actually equivalent to the integrability of a certain function. And in which case the energy also is gonna be given by phi of zero essentially, just like in the, in the flat space solution. So what's important is that this, this condition for finiteness of energy gives you the correct uh, boundary conditions around R equals zero uh, for the solutions that you wanna find for this system. So this is the main theorem. Uh, there exists a small value epsilon star less than one over 60 such that for all epsilon up to that, there is a solution to the system satisfying the following asymptotic conditions. So in the first column is R going to zero and the second column are going to infinity. Let me actually talk about infinity first. You see that the functions uh, psi, zeta, and w, they approach what they are in the riser nordstrom solution with a certain parameter m plus some exponentially small corrections. This was to be expected. But for small r, zeta is going to some number x, w is going to some number one, and psi is actually blowing up r to the minus epsilon y. So I have down here x is between 1 and 1.1, y is between 0 0.9 and 1. So you see that uh, Psi is actually blowing up, but it's very slowly because of this epsilon in the, in the exponent, that's a small number. So in particular, because of this, the, the blow up of Psi not being so dramatic, you can find that the energy is finite. So this is a good solution. And furthermore, it point-wise at any R, it actually approximates the flat space solution. Um, but what I wanna mention about this, uh, yes, yeah, so properties of this solution, the psi function blows up, as I mentioned it. So it's not gonna be equal to one because it's supposed to converge to one as R goes to infinity. And this actually implies that the relationship, the nice relationship we had before in, in Shadi's work for the other space times between the energy, the ADM mass and the bear mass, if you wanna call mu of zero, the bear mass, it actually does not hold anymore, but maybe that's fine. You just, if you wanna, have this, you define your bare mass in some different way. Uh, the Kretschmann scalar blows up just as mildly, r to the minus four, which is nice. But since my zeta function is actually not going to zero, uh, it's going to a number x that's slightly larger than one, you actually have the bare mass equal to zero in this space time. So all the ideas that Annegret was mentioning before, they do not apply here. I, I cannot, I don't know if the weak second uh, con uh, second contract weak monkey identity holds in this space time, but the techniques from that paper cannot be applied here. And another problem with this, so, so I, this is the last thing I will mention, is that the, the parameter mass, the parameter m that appears in, in here is the ADM mass, but it cannot be chosen a priori. The solution just says that there exists some parameter and potentially depending on the epsilon, if you do some numerics, you'll find that it looks like it's one half, but I could not prove that. So there's work to be done here. But most importantly, uh, my solution proof idea does not, cannot find other solutions with, which have a negative bare mass, mu of zero, less than zero. I've been working on this the past uh, few months. I still don't have any results to report on that, but I hope to have more soon and I, I hope that the, the solutions with a strictly negative bare mass will be more well-behaved, will, will actually allow you to study the, 
the weak Bianchi identity around R equals zero. So I don't I don't believe that this is the end of this problem yet, but it's in any case nice to know that there is a solution with finite energy. So I'm not going to mention any of the proof, but you can ask me about that if you'd like. So thank you. Yes, thank you so much, Eric. Let's unmute ourselves and thank Eric for a great presentation. Very nice. I think we have time for just one, one quick question uh, or comment. Go ahead, Volker. If I understand you correctly, you are saying that there are solutions to the Maxwell BLTP Einstein equations, which are not Weiss and Nordstrom. Is that true? That is true. Okay. Uh, you know that there are papers. It's difficult to hear you. <laughs> We, we don't we hear you. Your your audio is cutting. Let's see. Can you type it into the chat, Volker? Oh, sorry. Uh, okay. I, papers which claim the opposite. Okay. Okay. Yes, I think, paper I think which Eric claims can the answer. opposite. Uh, it's, it's, if I understand the question, this is a line that I skipped in my presentation here. There's a paper that claims the opposite, that, that there are no solutions other than yes. Reiser Nordstrom, provided yes. that you have a horizon, provided that at some yes. Yes. positive value of R, the, the zeta function actually is zero, which is exactly what I, I want to avoid here. I want to model the, the singularity as a, the particle as a naked singularity. So the solution that I found has a zeta that, that's strictly positive at all values of R. Yeah, but also, so not necessarily a black hole. Uh, to make a joke, so it, it feels like Volko is falling into a black hole. Values to this make right? And the question is, if your solution is different from Reisenotrim, even in the case when it's a naked singularity. <laughs> I think if I if I could understand the question, sorry, because your audio was cutting. So if I could understand the question, okay. I, is... I sent you an I sent you an email. You sent me an email? Okay. Yeah, yeah. I'll, okay. I'll take a look we at that. We discussed it by email. Yes. Sure. <laughs> Sorry for that. No, no problem. All right. <laughs> all right. Let's thank all the all the speakers for today's session. This concludes our uh, our first uh, block, and I hope I I will see all of you joining us on Thursday when we have another. Uh, marathon session with 12 more talks. Uh, so uh, don't forget that the passbook codes for every day is different. So when you want to get in on Thursday, make sure you use the correct passcode. And until then, uh, goodbye, everyone. And it was great seeing you today. Yeah, also from me, thanks everyone for joining us. It was very great to see some friends who I haven't seen in a long while, at least on video now. <laughs> <laughs> and stay safe everyone okay thanks bye bye, bye. Hey, thank you bye thanks bye bye bye, bye.